All right, everyone, I'm going to ask Lynn to officially call our meeting to order, please. The carrot. You ready, Athena? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, good morning. It's March 25th, 2023. This is a special meeting of the town council. Uh, we are allowed to have this meeting based on the open meeting law that was passed on November 7th, 2022. Uh, this meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, by phone, and as a, and um, and live stream. Hmm. Uh, given that we have a quorum of the council president, I'm calling the March 25th, 2023 town council meeting to order at 842. I'm gonna call on each counselor. Athena is going to walk around the room and see if uh, people are present and here and can be heard. Shalini Balmil. Here. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Yeah. <laughs> Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Okay. Present. <laughs> we'll accept that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Here. Uh, Pam Rooney. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. And Alicia Walker is not present at this time. Thank you. Uh, just two quick announcements. Uh, besides, there's no chat. This since it is a special meeting of the town council for the purposes of retreat, 
there will be no public comment during the meeting. Um, immediately following this meeting in this room and also on Zoom, uh, the CSSJC will be holding a listening session regarding the CREST program. And then I also wanna just again mention that there will be a screening of the big payback at Amherst College on March 30th at six o'clock PM. With that, I'm except to adjourn our meeting, I'm done as president. Thank you. So we're just gonna talk about our plan for the day. After this opening, <clears throat> We're going to have a brief introduction to appreciative inquiry, which is a method that Pamela and I agreed would be really great for this group today and a quick exercise. And then we'll delve into rules and procedures. There were some really great questions from counselors about rules and procedures, so I'm excited to get into that with you. We'll take a break and other breaks if we need to throughout the day. We'll have a discussion on meeting efficiency that will be informed by that conversation on rules and procedures. We're going to take a break for lunch, um, but then we'll do a working lunch. And Pamela is gonna lead uh, some more questions about appreciative inquiry after lunch or during lunch. And so the introduction that we do this morning is gonna inform that conversation later in the day. <clears throat> then we'll talk about the criteria for priorities that some folks sent in and uh, develop a list of criteria together. And then we'll use that criteria to talk about the priorities in front of the council now. We'll do a reflection and wrap up. We're gonna try and end by 1.30, we need to end by 1.30. And then we're gonna ask you all to stay for a few minutes to help tidy up because we do have that CSSJC and CREST meeting right afterwards. So good morning, everybody. I am really happy to be spending a good part of the day with you. Although this retreat is not happening in what I would consider ideal uh, locations, I've tried to plan the morning with some things to uh, stimulate all five senses, although we're saving the fifth for, for last. So as you came in this morning, there were table runners at your table so that you can have some color and some texture. Um, I asked you to hear just a little bit of the Michael Jackson, Man in the Mirror um, song as inspiration for inspiring change and responsibility. Um, for the sense of touch, I've uh, placed at uh, randomly a intention stone at your uh, desk or at your um, seat. And I've asked that you just take a moment and look at your specific intention and um, hold that for the day, I'm going to use Pat's, which is gratitude, but there, each of you have a different one. So that is your sense of touch. Uh, for smell, we'd like for you to just take a deep cleansing breath. Just center yourself. And if you are um, drinking a, a beverage that has an aroma, you might just really savor the smell of your tea or your coffee. If you have a beverage that doesn't have an aroma, I have a sage stick that I'm willing to share if anybody would like the sage. Yes. All right. So my role today is to act as your facilitator and moderator. Um, Athena, as you know, is your subject matter expert. And she's gonna be guiding you through really the meat of what we have planned for today. Um, the retreat format may feel a little touchy-feely, and that is by intention. Some parts of it may resonate with you, others may not, but I ask you to trust the process and trust the collective benefit for what we have planned for you today. And with that, I think um, we'll get started. Oh, that's right. So you do not have your mites on in front of you. We um, typically, uh, if we were in a restorative justice circle or in a circle process, only one person would be um, speaking at a time so there wouldn't be cross conversation. And that's the practice that we'd like to have for today. So there's only one mic and the person with the mic has uh, the floor 
and the rest of us will be listening with intention and curiosity and compassion. So I'll just add that this is a reminder. This is a reminder that we're listening to each other and listening to each person as they talk. So I'm just going to talk briefly about appreciative inquiry, give you a little introduction. It was developed by David Cooperwriter at Case Western Reserve University in the 1980s. It's a philosophy for organizational change. It's a strengths-based change strategy rather than a deficit-based straight change strategy. So rather than looking for what went wrong in the past, we're going to look at what we did right and use that to inform how we take action into the future. So there are some assumptions of appreciative inquiry. There's eight, so I'm going to read them. <clears throat> In every society, organization, or group, something works. What we focus on becomes our reality. Reality is created in the moment, and there are multiple realities. So there's 12, 13, 14, 15 different realities, and there isn't a right one or a wrong one. The act of asking questions of an organization or group influences the group in some way. We'll talk about that more in a minute. People have more confidence and comfort when they journey to the future, which is the unknown, when they carry forward parts of the past, which is known. And if we carry parts of the past forward, they should be the best parts, right? It's important to value differences and the language we use creates our reality. So those are the assumptions for appreciative inquiry. <laughs> Typically, appreciative inquiry uses a 5D cycle where you define what you're doing the inquiry about, you discover what has worked, you dream about using what has worked to envision the future, and then you design a path forward. And then the fifth D is to realize that re new reality. So the idea here is not less of more, what, <laughs> not less of more, not less of what we didn't do well, but more of what we did well. So we're going to try and identify areas where we were su successful in the past and expand those successes into the future, focusing on what works because we tend to grow in the direction of the things that we focus on. And we want, that's what we want to give more life to. So we're going to try and shift our attention to the problems and mistakes that we've made in the past, because we're already very good at thinking about the things that we've done wrong. I don't know about you, but I stay awake thinking about what I've done wrong in the past. So we're gonna try instead to think about what has gone right, the circumstances around what has gone right in the past and use those to inform where we wanna go in the future. And what has gone right, we're thinking about the moments that we felt most engaged, most effective, most valued, most heard. So this is meant to be a dynamic process of using those experiences to inform our future actions. <clears throat> Once we identify those moments, we use our imagination to see what might be if we carried them into the future. I'm gonna have to stop for drinks every so often, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so I wasn't watching the cat in the hat with my kids <laughs> this morning. Uh, this is actually a quote from Einstein. And what it means is we have the power to create what we imagine. What we imagine can happen, can happen. And this has been studied. It's not something that I'm making up right now. Um, if you'll all recall, the placebo effect, I'm sure you're familiar with that, where patients' belief in a treatment can lead to actual results. The Pygmalion effect, I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but that's when someone sets a high expectation for you and your performance exceeds what you, without that high expectation. There have also been studies about folks diagnosed with terminal cancer and their success rate has been unusually high when those individuals have engaged in therapy and done some positive uh, imagery. Folks going into heart surgery, when they enter with confidence versus fear, have a two to one recovery rate. What we can imagine can happen, can happen. I'll give you one more quick anecdote. So 
there was a study with bowling teams. <clears throat> okay, two bowling teams. <laughs> and there was video of the bowling teams that they showed both teams. One team, they only showed the clips of when things went right, they got all the strikes or whatever they do in bowling, touchdowns. <laughs> and the other team, they only showed their mistakes. So can anyone guess what happened when they viewed those and then went into their next match, bowling match? They both improved, but the team that watched their videos of success improved twice as much as the one that focused on their errors. What we can imagine can happen, can happen. And we, use, we wanna use our best moments to fuel our imagination about what can happen. Is anyone feeling skeptical? <laughs> because I'll admit that <laughs> Pamela and myself both experienced a little bit of a skepticism when we first encountered appreciative inquiry. But at this point, we're both feeling really positive that this is a great tool that we can use for today. I'm gonna to list some areas where they've used appreciative inquiry. The UN Global Compact, the United Religions Initiative, the city of Cleveland's decade long set of appreciative inquiry summits that created a shared vision of a, city, a green city on a blue lake. Governor Deval Patrick utilized appreciative inquiry for an industry-wide energy planning summit. U.S. Dairies Industry-Wide Systems Work on Sustainable Dairy. The Global Excellence in Management Initiative created appreciative inquiry groups in Africa, Asia, Asia and Latin America. Imagine Chicago was an appreciative inquiry-based um, community building exercise that was large-scale community development and it inspired Imagine projects in cities, states, and countries all over the world. We also use appreciative inquiry practices in our day-to-day -day meetings, in our relationships, and in classrooms. <clears throat> I'm going to give us an example. We have four kids in our family. <laughs> and uh, some weeks we're really good <laughs> at meal planning. And everything is moving smoothly. We've got a plan. We know what's for dinner. We know what's cooking. And as you can imagine, when I'm in meetings some nights and I'm at school some nights and my partner has things going on and kids have games and so on, it takes a little bit of coordination. When things go wrong and we're flying by the seat of our pants, not so much. It doesn't feel very good. So when we have a conversation about what we need to do next time, rather than getting into an argument about what we didn't do and who didn't go shopping and the planning that didn't happen, we think about, all right, <clears throat> when were we really well set up? What, were, what did we do? We had a meal plan at the beginning of the week. We both went shopping. We didn't have to make multiple trips throughout the week. <clears throat> so that's kind of a real life example of what we're doing here. So these first couple questions that we're gonna do next are just reflections for yourself. And then we're going to do an exercise together. Take a few moments to think of a time when you felt the council was effective and you felt engaged and valued. You can take some you can take some notes if you want to keep some notes to yourself, that's fine. And we'll be using these ideas later on in the meeting. Take just a couple more seconds.
All right, next, think about what factors supported these moments. What would it be like if we could expand the conditions that led to these moments into the future? You can write some notes. Try and think about that situation where you felt effective, engaged, and valued, and what led up to that. Pam, I see you shaking your head. If, if not with the council, then at any other time in your life, when were you feeling really successful and engaged and what led to that situation? This is an example of, of being really good at thinking what went wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> we have so much practice with what went wrong. Anna and Shalini, we're gonna do a group activity after this, but this is not the time. <laughs> All right. So just take a few moments to wrap up your thought. And then we're gonna do a think, pair, share. So think for a moment to yourself, during your time as a counselor, when did you feel most alive and engaged? What is a core factor that gives life to the council? With this, without this factor, the council wouldn't function. And what wish do you have to enhance the health and vitality of the council in the future? I still see people writing, so we'll take a few more minutes to, a few more moments, finish up your thoughts. All right, next we're gonna ask you to turn to a, a person on your right or left and talk about your answers to those questions. We're gonna take just a few minutes here talking with a partner.
All right, we'll take one more minute to try and finish up. All right, please finish up your thought.
Okay. Let's wrap up our conversations. Okay. Now we're going to take a moment to share what you reflected on and spoke about with your partner. I'm sorry. Did you think you're in charge today? Because you're wrong. <laughs> you're going first, my friend. So just share your reflection or something that that was that sparked something in you when you were sharing with Jennifer, and then we're just going to pass the mic around and and share with the group. I, we'll do this together. Okay. Yeah, I, I really think that we were not far apart in what we were thinking was um, would benefit the health of the uh, council. <laughs> well, um, in terms of uh, what core factor gives life, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to the council, we both agreed that it's that everybody here really loves Amherst. I mean, that's, you know, we may have different ideas of, you know, what's the best strategy to reach, you know, to have the best Amherst, but that, that's why we're all here. And then we discussed that, um, and I was saying for me, it was maybe the first time, because they sometimes say women aren't great at this, but that I've had the experience of really disagreeing with someone or, you know, during the council meeting, and then you walk out to the car and you're having, you know, like, I think we all really like each other, even if we disagree, so. Yeah, and we're a prime example. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's actually, no, it's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that uh, felt important uh, is the quality of listening um, and for the health of the council if we could work on imagining l listening where our hearts and our heads were cracked a little bit and the words the ideas could come in and we could create consensus that we could create something bigger and better than any one faction's ideas and I, uh, you know so alicia walker can you hear us yes i can thank you lynn thank you uh, similarly, we, Mandy and I, were not very far apart. Uh, we had different ways of, oh, sorry. Similarly, Mandy and I were not very far apart. We had different ways of saying sort of the same thing. And it was also related to what Pat and Jennifer said um, with respect to listening. And um, how, what I offered is that it sort of feels like we've typecast each other at this point in our work and how can we get beyond this idea of what we might think about one another um, and do more deep listening as Pat as Pat said. Was... Michelle summarized it well. I think the other thing was with that deep listening, the recognition that we're not, I, I put it as acceptance of errors, but we don't always say things right. We don't always do things and getting past that to listen to and and come together and listen to really what people are trying to say. Should I start? I'll, I'll start because I, I actually was thinking about the first question. When when did you think things went well? You know, where Pam go? Um, but it, it builds on this. Uh, Way back when, in the first term, we had a, uh, we faced a decision on polling places, and the initial uh, suggestion was put them all in one place, and we were split at the first vote on it. The public came in. Um, we had time to make change, and we listened, and we all came together unanimously. So it was that that uh, I would just add to the health. The giving ourselves time to think so that we can listen, because otherwise we come in with preformed positions and we just have to argue about them, but really that time element, and we often don't have it. So that was one that just came to my mind of a, a coming together when we were split, that where it worked. Um, 
So I agree with the listening and the time. And I think sometimes we don't take time to listen and we don't take enough time to listen to both each other and to the public. So I think Kathy's example of that polling situation was a great example. I started out because every year we do Paul's evaluation. Everybody has to do it. It's an arduous task, but it allows us to really reflect on what our goals have been and where we stand with them and maybe how we should change them. It also allows us to reflect on the town staff and all the work they do and then what we have to do. And we spend a lot of time on that task and everybody has to participate, so. Can you hear me? Okay. So on the first question, I went back to the very beginning of the council and with setting up CRC and discussions we were having, um, and David Zomick was our helper, on preserving land in Amherst. And I felt very positive about things. But since then, I realized that when I feel alive and engaged, it is not in the council. It is when I'm in the district. It is with the people. It's with my community. It's the neighborhood. And I feel fabulous. And I feel that my job is representing them. But when I come to the council, it's very discouraging when I can tell ahead of time exactly what the vote's going to be before the discussion. So I, I feel that uh, I feel it's a battle. And um, I think that great changes need to be made. But I do I have the optimism that they can be made? I'm not sure yet, but um, Shalini has a more positive view and we're gonna have Shalini's view. Before we move on to your answers, Dorothy, what were the circumstances around that CRC situation that made it feel so good? Well, people listened to each other as if they cared to hear what they had to say. And they, we were inventing things together, we were creating. Um, we discussed things, but it wasn't from ensconced, ensconced positions. Um, and we were trying to figure out what can we do in a positive way? Thank you. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, I, I feel most alive when, um, when I feel that I'm able to contribute and my strengths are used uh, in service of something that's going to have an impact and it's impacting people, real people. And that's, I think, what gives life to this council is what a privilege we have that we are here in this room and we're making decisions that's really impacting people and their lives, and especially people who don't have a voice and we don't hear them often. So, um, yeah, and, and that's related to then what the health and vitality is, um, you know, we come with different perspectives and that's a strength actually, but how do we create processes and really able to have that collective shared vision and working together and we just thank you for the retreat and the suggestion for doing that because I think that's what today is about is how can we, because I, all of us care and we all love our town and we love what we do. We want to build community. We want to have an impact, change our town um, for the better. So how do we do that? Thank you for organizing. Do you want to go first? You go me. Okay. So Pam and I talked about, one of the things that we were saying was we uh, have felt most alive and engaged when there feels like there's a common path. Even if folks disagree on the end result, we recognize the path that we're going down and um, you know the, the process that we need to get there. Uh, I gave the example of, and also when we are coming in um, ready to ask questions and actually hear answers, right? So I gave the example of how uh, an experience that I had with Pam about this on poll hearings, um, and it was, something that I came in and was like, all right, poll hearing, like there's other things in the agenda that are way more exciting, but okay, let's talk about telephone polls, thinking that it was just kind of a checkbox. And, and Pam helped me to, to see in that moment that, oh, no, 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 this is not just a standard thing. We should be questioning it. We should be asking things. And so, you know, and, and now I, I'm, I'm like combative at every poll hearing, I'm ready. <laughs> um, and so, so I think that it's one of those things where, where we can recognize 
learning about process from one another, but also coming in with with the questions and the um, the willingness to to look past whatever notions that we come in with to to recognize the value and find value, even if we um, don't agree. Um, and then, yeah, so we also talked about the don't tell mom. OK, all right. She's got the she's got the rest. Also, when we share. I get, you know. <laughs> so we we definitely agree that that one of the, the better moments in in any of the work that we do is when people come prepared, they are focused, there is a there's a set of expectations that we will create something that's better than what we have now. And again, we may definitely all definitely do come from different perspectives and we don't necessarily know what that end result will be, but a little bit like ZBA hearings, um, often the process of discussion and clarification is a better process than not having a ZBA hearing or review. And I think I, I feel a little bit like the ZBA sometimes. Um, actually listening to people is something that we both agreed that um, is really critical. Um, Fact-driven rather than emotional-driven is a really good thing, at least from my perspective, because that's the way I'm made up. Other people may not be. Um, and just better listening across the board. Thank you. No. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, so, <laughs> so Andy and I, we were able to speak about uh, number one a bit. We were we got pretty in, engaged, and we had. Oh, can you hear me now? Andy and I were able to talk about uh, number one, or point number one rather. Um, and so for me, um, the time that I felt most engaged was really, you know, walking up this step, these steps in our inaugural meeting. Um, I didn't walk in with just myself, you know. Um, I'm a, a generational resident here, a, a black woman, and I represent the B and the I personally in BIPOC. And uh, my ancestors uh, experienced genocide on this land, were enslaved here, and I had felt electricity and goosebumps walking up these stairs that I hadn't ex expected to feel coming up and to meet with all of you and looking at all of you as, you know, individuals that our community here had determined would serve, um, would serve them, would represent them. And I looked at us as like a sense of stone soup. I appreciate your comments in a way, Dorothy, but I can assure you, you do not know how my mind works. And I think that we're all individuals and um, I hope that we can really keep that and, you know, understand that, you know, we were represent where community may have fallen towards and may think that, you know, this is a battle. I'm in no competition with anyone here. I wish the best for us all, but really for the community and what we can do um, for the community. And so, thank you. So we had a good discussion about each other's um, thoughts on the subject, even though we came at it a little bit differently, because I came at it thinking about when was it that we came from different perspectives on an issue, but came out of it unanimous on a solution. And the one that I came up with, thanks to Michelle, was the uh, athletic fields at the high school that we had a really um, tense and disagreement about what the council's role is and what the right result was, but yet we came to a resolution that was unanimous on a way, on a path forward. I think that uh, it was because we listened to each other, we thought hard together over several meetings about what it was that our role in it should be and how we could most effectively um, exercise that vote, which uh, I think was an example to me of when the council is at its absolute best and um, 
I thought that that was what the assignment was. So uh, that's where I went to that. I, and I very much appreciated the opportunity that two of us had to talk about each other's thoughts on the question, which came at it from that different perspective. Alicia, I'm recognizing that you're here with us too. Do you want to take a moment to share your reflections on these questions? Yeah, sure. I think I didn't have too much time to reflect just because I came in when everyone was answering, but I think at least to a degree, I've been hearing what everyone else has said and has have been really like agreeing and feeling deeply what everyone has said. Um, and I think in terms of when I feel most alive and engaged as a counselor, I really, uh, what Dorothy said is resonating with me when I'm hearing from constituents um, is when I feel the most alive and engaged um, and knowing what decisions I'm making, like understanding the impact that they have in the community and on other people's lives um, and being able to hear that impact and to, you know, at sometimes direct that impact in ways that would be more helpful um, makes me feel really alive and the engagement in having people reach out to me um, and trusting me with their concerns. Um, it feels engaging. Um, and I, I like that feeling. And I, I agree that the core factor um, that gives life to this council is that we all really care about Amherst. And I think we all really feel like this is our home. Um, and so I, I love that we share that, that we all are here for a positive reason, regardless of how our conversations go. I think we're here because we care. Um, and so I think that makes, you know, even though it makes the work challenging sometimes, I think it makes it that much more important. Um, and so I do really like being a part of a group of people who have the same passion in the sense that we want what's best for where we live and for the people in the town that we live in. Um, and what wish do I have to enhance the health and vitality of the council in the future? Um, I agree with listening. I think that has been something for me where I, I don't always feel heard, but when I do feel heard, I think that feels, I mean, it feels really good, but also I think when we're listening to each other, it allows us to come to consensus is like the one that Andy was talking about. I think that was a time where I felt like we were all really hearing the concerns that we had and taking them into consideration and trying to figure out how can we, you know, bring everyone's concerns, everyone's thoughts together, but still move, move forward. Um, and so I think that being able to listen to each other wholeheartedly, being able to put our, our heads together and, you know, being able to identify what is the goal, how do we get there moving, moving things forward, um, I think is really important to the health and vitality of the council. And I think honesty. Thank you all for taking the time to do that. One of the reasons that we identified appreciative inquiry for this group is because it aligns so well with the council's values. At the end of the rules, the rules that everyone has voted together is a statement of values. <clears throat> You've all agreed that you value a people-friendly approach to governing, robust public participation, new ideas and approaches to governing while honoring what has been done in the past. You value diversity, equity, and inclusion. You value allowing people the space to be human and make mistakes and grow from those mistakes and experience adverse situations without thinking of themselves or others as lesser than. You value being your authentic selves while you're serving in your role as counselors, leading with curiosity, respect, teamwork. And so all of those values are exactly what appreciative inquiry is pointing at. So let's take a moment, 10 seconds, to internally recommit to those values.
thank you all so much for doing that and for hanging in there with us. Does anyone need a short break before we move on to rules? Yes. Okay. Let's take a quick five minute break and then we'll come back and, and do rules. Okay. Thank you. You can turn off your video if you like. We're gonna take just one more minute to finish up a break and come back and get settled in again.
Okay, we're gonna come back and get started on laws, rules, and procedures. Okay, I hope everybody had a chance to move around a little bit. <clears throat> Who are we missing, Pam? Okay, we're just waiting for Pam to come back and then we'll move on. All right, we're gonna talk about laws, rules, and procedures next. I know everyone is really excited to have this conversation and so am I. <clears throat> so first I'm gonna start by saying that we are governed by federal law, state law, our charter, and the council's own rules. And when there are situations where there's not a clear rule, that's when we fall back to Robert. So I know there's been a lot of questions about Robert's rules, but I just wanna give a reminder that all of these things take precedence above Robert's rules. So we look to our own rules, we look to the charter, we look to general bylaws, state law and federal law before we turn to Robert. And we do that because following the law creates a foundation of transparency and validity for council actions. The council is governed and empowered by federal law, state law, our own charter and and the council rules. And when the council takes action following the law and the rules, those actions are less susceptible to challenge because we can prove that we did everything right. So when the council has authorized borrowing before a lender will agree to give us that money, we have to show that we've posted meeting notices properly in accordance with the charter, that we've had public forums and allowed public participation at those forums. We show that finance committee has made their report to the council. We have to prove that we've done all those things before a lender will say, all right, here's the money. The charter bestows powers and duties on the council, the school committee, the library trustees, the housing authority, the Oliver Smith will elector, the town manager, I'm named in the charter, but I only have duties, no powers. No, please don't. And the charter requires that the council make rules, which at a minimum have to include how often to have meetings, how special and emergency meetings can be called, <clears throat> what to include in the record, written record. Why do we have rules? Aside from the fact the charter makes you make rules. For clarity, we all know what happens first and next and so on during a meeting. Everyone knows what to expect. The rules guide how council as a whole, counselors interact with each other, with members of the public, with other boards and committees, with the town manager and efficiency, how we can we best and most effectively conduct our business? The rules try to answer that question. They're about how you decide as a group what is fair to everyone. 
Who gets to speak when? How do we keep the meeting on track? How do we handle intense disagreement? The rules try to answer all of these questions. And if the rules aren't working, then the council has an opportunity to change them, to figure out how to do that better. And so this is part of what we're gonna talk about today, what's working. In meetings, it's virtually impossible for any human being to perform the function of the president without a considerable body of established rules to go by. I'm sure Lynn will attest to the fact that there have been many, many situations where she had to figure out what to do next. Lynn? The rules help guide those decisions. And the council's job is to make sure that her decisions are in accordance with those rules. So you're holding yourselves accountable for following the rules. You're holding the president accountable for following the rules. So I just want to take a moment to recognize that Lynn's job is really hard. But you've all voted to let her do that job. <clears throat> and the last, clarity, efficiency, and fairness. Rules are based on a regard of, for rights. Everyone has rights during a meeting. Individual counselors have rights to speak, to make motions, to vote. The council as a whole has rights to take actions. Minority of a council has rights. A strong minority can block some actions. Members of the public have rights. The charter's given mem members of the public rights to speak during regular meetings. And all of these rights have to be regarded at the same time. And that's what the rules are trying to do. They're trying to give everybody an equal playing field and they're trying to protect everyone's rights. The rules are meant to help do that. All right, the most exciting part of our meeting today. We're gonna to talk about some motions. <laughs> I got a second over here. So, <laughs> so, um, so this is Robert's, a very simplified version of Robert's format for taking actions. If we're following Robert to the letter, and I know council does things in a little bit more of a relaxed format than this, if we're following Robert's rules, no discussion takes place until there's a motion on the floor. The motion is on the floor and now the discussion take, can take place and the discussion focuses on the merits of that motion. There can be secondary motions, there can be tertiary motions, and we're gonna talk about how to dispose of those and which ones take precedence before a vote on the main motion and the meeting moves to the next action item. I've also given you a handout, Alicia. I'm gonna provide this in the packet so that you can see it too, but there's um, some pages in your handout about precedence, motions, and so on. What motions are in order when a main motion is on the floor? Here's the list of motions from the rules. You can move to adjourn, you can move to recess, appeal the decision of the presiding officer, and so on. We're gonna talk about which motions get taken first, second, and so on coming up. But first, we're gonna talk about the motions that we don't use very often. Appeals, points of order, and questions of privilege. Because I wanna make sure that we all know how to use those. A point of order is how the council holds itself and the president accountable for following the rules. So if somebody's doing something that might be in violation of the charter or open meeting law or the council's rules, you call a point of order and the president decides how to address that. The president might take a moment to consult with the town manager or the clerk. The president might ask the body if it wants to vote. Points of order can be called without being recognized. And then the president would decide if the point is well heard or not. So if maybe somebody veers off topic during the discussion and we're no longer talking about the motion on the floor, point of order, this isn't relevant to the motion that's on the floor, but the president can say your, your point of order is well heard. And then she can ask the member to say, to stay on topic. <clears throat> An appeal is what happens if you don't agree with the president's decision. If a point of order isn't well heard by the president, 
a counselor can make a motion and seek a second and then vote on the ruling. An appeal is debatable, and the only motions that are that is in order when an appeal is on the table are to adjourn or recess. So they need to be de dealt with right away. A question of privilege. Honestly, I had to look this up because it, it's foreign language when you aren't looking at the rules, when you're not reading Robert's rules. Question of privilege usually pertains to something that's happening in the room that's preventing the meeting from working properly. It's way too hot in here. We need to ask somebody to turn the AC up. This can also happen when um, maybe I've st stated the vote incorrectly. And somebody's going to say point of privilege. I think that vote was incorrect. Can we have a, a read back of the, the vote? One of the, the second under a privilege of a counselor, a counselor disputes the accuracy of minutes approved in their absence. That would come up because we have to first follow the state law and our charter. That would come up as a counselor comment at the end of the meeting or a future agenda item asking the president to put um, an amendment of the minutes of the meeting that they were missed on a future agenda so that they can be corrected. And most times questions of privilege are addressed informally without a vote. If there's too much noise in the room, then we take a pause and we figure out how to proceed and deal with the noise or the heat or whatever. We don't need a formal motion. <clears throat> Question. Can you please give an example of a secondary and tertiary motion before we get into too many more details? I'm going to get to that when we talk about motions. <clears throat> First, I'm going to do orders of pref order of pref uh, precedence, and then we're going to get into motions and secondary motions and tertiary motions and so on. So when a main motion is on the floor, any of these motions, I think in most circumstances, would be in order. Now, if we have a main motion on the floor and someone makes a motion to refer this to a committee, we take the motions above refer before we take the motions below refer. So if someone has moved to refer the matter to a committee, a motion to amend isn't in order and a motion to call the question would be taken first. And that calling of the question would be on the motion to refer, not the main motion. I'm going to give a few examples. So if it's unclear now, I'm hoping to clear it up. Here's an example. We have a motion to postpone to a certain time. The motions above it are, would be in order, and the motions below it would be out of order. If the main motion is to adopt the resolution concerning overconsumption of chocolate by town councilors, a counselor might say, this isn't worth our time. I move to adjourn. That's not debatable. We move to an immediate vote. So if somebody wants to call the question, no. If somebody wants to refer to a snacks committee, no. We need to take up that motion to adjourn first. Okay? Here we go. The motion to adjourn is the first motion that we deal with if it comes up. Here's another example. We want to adopt that resolution. Somebody calls the question, motion to refer is out of order. A motion to amend is out of order. So up here on the screen, this order of precedence, Anna? When you're using, you're using the words in order and out of order, and I want to confirm that when you're talking about in order, you mean acceptable per the rules, not a quantifiable one, two, three. Motion in order is a motion that according to the rules should, should be, is acceptable then, okay? Not in order of one, two, three. Thank you for asking that question because I know this stuff can get really confusing. So if the main motion is to adopt that resolution and someone makes a secondary motion to refer it to a committee, 
which motions are in order now. We have a motion to refer on the floor. So the motions above it are in order. Once a motion to refer is on the floor, we can't amend the resolution. We can't postpone it indefinitely until there's a vote on that motion to refer. And when I say in order and out of order, again, this is all up to you to hold yourselves accountable to the process and the rules. It's up to the president to go, that motion's out of order right now. We need to deal with a motion to refer before we can deal with a motion to amend, okay? I'm looking for nods, but if there are questions, let's pause here. So I'm, I'm going to make a comment, which is true for me and may not be true for others. But if I'm trying to think about the issue at hand and what I'm going to say, and the, the meeting is going on, and I'm trying to think about what I'm going to say, and I scribble down a few nouns or something, I am cap not capable of doing that. And I will tell you, Athena, that's why I appreciate your being at the meetings, because this, my brain couldn't, cannot work on the two levels at once. So. I, it's interesting to hear you explain this, but I can tell you, my brain is not going to learn it. It's just too complicated. But I like the idea that some things can, can be done and others can't be done. That I can take away. Thank you for saying that. I don't expect everyone to memorize the rules. I refer, refer back to the rules in the charter all the time. If there's a question in a meeting, I look at the rules before I answer that question. If somebody emails me a question about what motions are in order or during the meeting, I wanna make a motion, how do I handle it? I'm gonna check the rules before I give you an answer. So I don't expect you to know everything. And I think that one thing we might take away from this meeting is that sometimes we need to take a pause before we move too quickly. And I know that part of the issue is that our meetings are long and we can talk about how we manage the meetings after this. But sometimes, like you said, we need a moment to think. We need a moment to hear what somebody has said before we move on to the next speaker. And this is part of Lynn's very challenging job. When there are five people with their hands up, you want to get to everybody. You want to move the meeting along. But there's a balancing act between moving too quickly and making sure everyone is heard. And I'm just going to point out, recess is right up there at the top. If you need to take a break, before the council takes a vote, call for a recess. You say, I think this is moving too quickly. I just wanna pause for, can we recess for three minutes? Can we recess for five minutes? I just wanna think about what's going on. I wanna reflect on what everybody said before we take a vote. Calling for recess does not require a vote. Formally calling for a recess, somebody can ask you, can we take a short break? And if you say no, they can say, I move to, to recess for five minutes. And if there's a second and a vote, then we're going to recess whether you like it or not. <laughs> okay. Michelle. Um, so as we're moving through a motion that's on the floor, is it the clerk's role or the chair's role to sort of navigate or, or, or inform us of when we're in or out of order or something should isn't acceptable? So it's the president's job. If, the, if somebody moves a motion that's out of order, it's the president's job to say that's an out of order. We need to take care of this motion that's above it first. If she has a question, then she might pause to check with one of us to see that what she's saying is right which is fine, and I think at times very valuable. Um, but then it's everyone's responsibility to know the order of prefer precedence, and I don't expect you to memorize them, but it's a handy thing to have on hand during meetings so that if something is taken out of order, you can say, point of order. I think we need to deal with this motion first because it's above in order of pre precedence. Does that make sense? Uh, I think that's very helpful, and I think Many of us haven't known how to use point of order, so the uh, the 
group you identified, Michelle, there was an attached free thing that we could read that made the point Athena just did that any one of us, if we're paying attention, and that's a big if, because I often just don't carefully read the motion um, and then think of where have we done something, but, but being able to use that tool. Thank you. It's really difficult to keep all of this in your head while you're considering, while you're listening to each other, while you're considering what's going on. And again, taking a moment to pause should be okay. If somebody's not clear on something, if you're not sure if that should be taken first, you can ask the president. Can we just pause for a second? Because I'm not sure. I just want to check. I want to ask the clerk a question. I want to ask the town manager a question. I think it's up to the group to decide how it wants to deal with those moments. But my suggestion would be to allow each other a moment for clarification. If something is happening too fast, if you're not sure about something. I don't know whose hand was up first. I need to do a clerical thing. Alicia's uh, computer decided to do an update in the middle of all of this. And so she's temporarily out of the meeting, but will return. Okay. okay. Thank you. Could you clarify what lay on the table or pause discussion? Shalini asked to for clarification about what lay on the table or pause discussion means. That's a great question because we don't use that one very much either. So if the council decides that something needs to pause before we move to take care of something that's more important first, so sometimes we handle this informally. The only instance that I'm recalling right now is when we had a proclamation or a resolution that came up and Mandy asked, can we lay this on the table so that we can waive the rules? So there's a situation where there's something that we need to do first before we can do the thing that's in front of us. So, and again, it's up to the president and the council to how formally or informally it wants to deal with those things. Do we need to take a vote to lay something on the table or can we all just agree that we need to vote on waiving the rules before we vote on this resolution? The example, the example was there was a, a last minute proclamation or a resolution that came to the council. It didn't have a GOL review. And according to the rules, we need a review from GOL before the council acts on a resolution proclamation and so on. <clears throat> so during that conversation, Mandy recognized that we hadn't had a review by GOL and the motion was already on the floor to adopt that proclamation. And so she asked to lay it on the table so that we could waive the rules and then vote on the resolution. No, it, it, we waived the rules and then voted on the proclamation. Okay. Um, I'm not sure who's first. Just a quick follow up to that. So, would that, did a point of order need to come first before Mandy laid it on the table in that case? Or, like, point of order, we need to lay this on the table, or can you just go right to the lay it on the table? That's a good question. It depends how the chair wants to run their meeting and how formally or informally. Now, Robert's Rules is a really formal set of procedures. If you want to take things more formally, then we're going to have point of order. We haven't waived the rules yet. We need to lay this on the table. There's a motion to lay it on the table. There's a second. There, there's a vote. In the past, we've done this pretty informally. We've said, you know what? yeah, we need to vote on this first. We're all just going to agree by consensus that we're going to lay it on the table so that we can take something else up. But if you want to go point of order, motion to lay this on the table. So I, I think, Athena, I'm since we're informal, I'm Googling this too. There's a nuance between lay on the table and uh, postponed for another time because it's used politically, lay on the table, also to say we're not ready to decide this. It's not just pending something else, but it needs more consideration. So it's very similar to postponed um, and sometimes used interactively um, when it's, we need, when I was thinking of our earlier exercise, we need more time to talk about this. We need to more time to listen to each other. So to me, it's, there's a nuance between the two. So lay on the table usually means we need to deal with something else first, not we need more time to think about it. Go 
Right. You know, I'm just saying, I'm just reading the way people use it. It could be that. It also could be that we need more time. It's kind of premature. We need more time to think about it. So I, I would say my opinion would be that it would be clearer to everyone and the public if the intention is to postpone it to the next meeting or, or to a later time to move to postpone it. To lay on the table, you could say, I, I move to lay this on the table. I think we need to deal with some other action item first because I think that's more important and then come back to it later in the meeting. And so in my mind, a lay on the table is to come back to later in that meeting and a postponement is to come back to it at another meeting or after maybe something in particular has happened at the meeting. But it, it's a little confusing. The council can decide how it wants to deal with those different situations and what makes sense at that time. Um, I would, since postpone and postpone to a time certain is one of the areas that I think has caused some of the greatest discomfort in the council and conflict. I, are you going to go over that later or could you go over it now? The move, movement to postpone, which basically stops discussion. There's a difference between a motion to postpone or lay on the table and the charter provision that allows a counselor to unilaterally say, I'm bumping this to the next council meeting. So how do you want to take that? We've just talked about what works and everyone has agreed that listening to each other and some grace has worked in the past. So if someone is saying, I need more time to think about this. It's up to all of you to decide, am I gonna to listen to that person? Or is this so important that we need to vote on it tonight? And there's an opportunity to vote, to say, we all agree that we need more time to think about this or not. And then the individual has an opportunity to say, no, I really need more time to think about this. There's too much going on. I'm gonna just use my charter right to postpone. Um, there's delaying a vote or stopping a vote and there's stopping conversation. I know that when some people have felt really upset, it's when they were basically told in, in very polite terms to shut up. You can't talk anymore. But sometimes you just want to continue the conversation, but you might can understand why maybe a vote would be postponed. But I don't know if that's dealt with in the world of Robert's Rules. Can you repeat your question? Do these things, you talk about delaying a vote or postponing a vote, but do they also stop all conversation? It's when they stop all conversation that people feel upset. The motions that are starred are not debatable. A motion to adjourn, a motion to re recess, and raising the question of privilege or laying on the table are not debatable. We move to an immediate vote. The charter provision, these are the rules. These are the motions in order of precedence in the rules. The charter provision is putting the brakes on the everything. The conversation ends. We're going to bump this to the next meeting. A motion to postpone to a certain time is debatable. So Robert's rules apply when motions are on the table. Sometimes the council has discussions without motions on the table. But, you know, in some sense, if a motion's on the table and the council says we postpone that motion and votes to postpone the motion to a certain time, there's no more discussion. Even if you wanted more discussion because the council has just stopped discussion on that motion. So it has the same effect as the charter right to postpone when a motion is on the table. The question is the council doesn't always 
act as formally or treat its meetings as formally and sometimes has discussions before a motion is on the table or without even intention to put a motion on the table. And I think that's sometimes where some of the confusion comes in. Thank you for adding to that, Mandy. And that that's right. So if there is a main motion on the floor and now the motion on the floor is to postpone to a certain time, the discussion now is about postponing to a certain time. And if the council votes no, we wanna take this up now and that motion fails, then we come back to the main motion. Um, I just had a question like if we're having a meeting on Monday, it's a special, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so I think it was Andy that made the suggestion. We were having a discussion about the reserve funds and the override vote. And then it looked like, it, you know, we needed maybe more information. It was going on for a long time. So then I think Andy suggested that we refer to another meeting. Now it wasn't a vote. We were just having, how did that come about? We could do that. The council voted to call a special meeting for this coming Monday to talk about that one item. There was a vote. So it wasn't a motion to, I think it was Pat's motion actually. It wasn't a motion, to, a motion to postpone to a certain time because there wasn't a motion on the floor. So in order to do these secondary motions, you have to have something to do a motion to. And when there's nothing on the floor to do a motion to, then what are you doing? You're, you know, you, you can't amend something because it's not on the floor to amend yet. Does that make sense? Okay, and if we were gonna take these things very formally, every time a council made a referral, the motion to adopt it would come first and then the motion to refer it would come next. What we often do is use a motion to refer as the primary motion. Alicia, please go ahead. Thank you, Athena. I think I understand what you're saying. It sounds very clear to me, but I just am wondering about that council meeting. Was there not a motion to refer on the table? on last Monday? Yeah, because I think you said that there would have to, if you wanted a secondary motion, there would have to be something that you do it on to and there was no motion on the floor, but wasn't there a motion to refer? And isn't that at the top? So, or you can't do anything else after you have the motion to refer, but that was on the table or it wasn't. There was no motion on the floor because the council rules say that an appropriation or borrowing is automatically referred to the finance committee. So there was no motion needed. And so okay. there was no opportunity to amend at that point. And that's why we had an email exchange during the meeting about making an amendment at that time. And on top of that, <clears throat> the charter says that we need a report from the finance committee before it can act on an appropriation order outside the budget. And we also need to hold a public forum. So a motion to put that appropriation order on the floor at that point wouldn't have been an order because it would have been breaking the, the rules in the charter. So we couldn't have a motion on the floor to do that. We needed a report from finance committee. We needed a public forum. And then once we've checked those boxes, we can put a motion to adopt that appropriation order on the floor and amendments can be made at that point. I see you nodding. Are we good? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Andy, I see your hand up. Yeah. Uh, I think it was what was also unusual about the um, situation last Monday, which Alicia is referring to, is that uh, the president had already proposed and we had accepted a procedure that we were going to allow discussion prior to, even though it was automatically referred, so that um, it meant that we were in a discussion with an understanding that there would not be a motion and that was an unusual circumstance, but it was what would happen. And I don't think it's that unusual. Often we have something that comes before the council that gets referred to a committee. There's an understanding that it needs to get referred to a committee, but we want the council to have an opportunity to provide feedback to the committee about maybe what counselors want that committee to talk about and then report back to the council. So I, I agree that situation was a little bit different. Even finance committee took it up a little bit differently because you had a motion to make a recommendation before the appropriation order was even in front of you. So in all of this, it's up to the chair and it's up to members to go, hey, this doesn't make sense. It's not following the rules. And if you don't do that, then it flies. <clears throat> And the irony is 
this is a preliminary to Monday's meeting where in fact the finance committee is now having a meeting the next day. And on April 3rd, at this point, we have scheduled the public forum. And so we're still in that period of providing information to people and having a discussion. But on Monday night, that's all it is. It's still, I mean, people during their discussion can say, gee, I would like the finance committee to consider this but we're not going to be in a motion mode at that point because it will go to the finance committee. Then on the third, that's at least what we assume at this point, it will come back. There will be a public forum, which is required. And then we'll have a motion on the floor, which will be the motion regarding the appropriation language. And at that point, if a counselor is still wanting to amend the appropriation language, they can amend it on the third. They can also talk about it in finance. That's, it's all there. But if they don't get out of finance, for instance, what they want, then they can amend, make an amendment on the third. Okay. Is that, I, I really think this is important because we're in this intense period of all of us trying to understand and listen and even gathering a whole lot more information along the way. And I think we need to allow ourselves and the public that opportunity. Thanks for that clarification. I don't wanna to get too in the weeds about that particular issue. I wanna to stick to how we're doing this, but I think it's great to have this clarity right now because we have something in front of us coming up on Monday. Is there a question over here? Uh, well, first I just wanted to thank you uh, for this, and I think that it, it's clear and speaking for myself, this is really helpful because I think many of us are have a lot of confusion here. And um, and if we do imagine that the messages that we send the public, um, you know, when when we're confused and you have that can further confuse them. And I also think that this would be a wonderful offering for um, incoming council to have this and also just as a refresher, um, you know, for current council. So there, there are my comments. Thank you. I really appreciate that that suggestion, and I think already we're thinking about adding a conversation about rules and motions to an orientation for the next council. So thank you for making that suggestion, Alicia. You have your hand up. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree. This is extremely helpful. Um, I don't think I'll be able to remember it, like Dorothy said, but I, I think it's extremely helpful. Um, and even having this just literally written like this makes it a lot easier to understand. Um, I think for me, and I know you didn't want to spend too much time on a specific, like on this specific situation, but just for an example to the question is that I think it becomes more confusing to me when it's referred to committees outside of the council. And so I'm wondering if those same, like if this applies if we're in finance or if we're in council and like referrals between the two committees, if then that doesn't change any order of precedence or any other things that have to happen. Because I think that situation was more confusing to me, less because of the fact that an amend, you can't amend when there's an emotion to refer on the floor, but more because there was a vote that happened in finance that I thought would then go to the council like a motion that was voted on that would then move to the council and have a vote. And then I guess I'm confused about the process that happens there. Like if something is voted in finance, does it then go to the council to become voted on? Or like, I think that was the more confusing part. And I don't know if that's something we're also gonna go over, but that would be helpful. That's me. a really great question. <clears throat> so what happened in this particular situation was that finance committee made a recommendation and Andy, I'm sorry to pick on you. But it, it would have been out of order because there wasn't a motion on the floor to make a recommendation to the council. So there was a motion to amend a recommendation or make a recommendation that that wasn't in front of you yet. So the appropriation and borrowing order hadn't come up for the council yet or for the finance committee yet. And so the recommendation on that appropriation and borrowing order was a little bit putting the cart ahead of the horse. And I think that might be why there's a little bit of confusion about what's going on. So what happened, um, and I'm going to reiterate for, I'm, I think everyone knows what had happened, but there was a motion to recommend to the council using 10 million uh, for capital from capital stabilization to reduce the amount 
uh, for the debt exclusion. And that came up before Finance Committee had put on the floor a recommendation for the council to adopt that borrowing authorization. That motion for 10 million failed. And then there was another motion to use $5 million. That recommendation did pass in Finance Committee. And so the $5 million was included on the appropriation and borrowing order that the council saw last Monday because it was already recommended by Finance Committee. It wasn't a done deal. Finance Committee had decided a little bit ahead of time to make a recommendation to use that $5 million. So that came, that's what came to the council. The recommendation on the entire appropriation and borrowing order hasn't occurred yet. So we're gonna have a council meeting this Monday to talk about it. Finance Committee is gonna have a meeting on Tuesday to consider what happened on Monday and make their recommendation. And then that's gonna come back to the council as a primary action. Alicia, did I answer all of those questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so my question, question comment is, oh, it, so my question kind of comment is, so we went a little out of order, but I, it seems like that's a good thing because it is leading us to have a special meeting on Monday to really discuss this. It seems that if Alicia's, Alicia's motion didn't come until April 3rd, we wouldn't have had a chance to give it the consideration, you know, or any, that's just an example, no matter what the motion was, it seems like we needed more time like this Monday meeting to fully consider it. So it seems like if we had gone completely according to Roberts or the charter, whichever, that we wouldn't have had the time we need. It's up to the president and the committee chair to decide how they want to take things up. It must, it's up to the chair and the president how they want to take things up. If they want to take a motion that might be out of order, it's up to them. I think there was some confusion from counselors and members of the public. And this is just my opinion. I think there was some confusion because of what happened in finance committee and because of what the council was dealing with on Monday. That muddled muddied the waters a little bit about what was happening on Monday. We got some emails saying vote this or that way. And it was like, we're not doing that yet because we can't, because we haven't had a public forum. We haven't had a recommendation from the finance committee. Now, Alicia had an opportunity to make um, an, an amendment on the recommendation when it was in front of finance committee. And then that recommendation and Kathy's recommendation, <clears throat> Kathy's amendment would have been included in the finance committee recommendation that finally came to the council on April 3rd. There was a discussion this past Monday, and that's an opportunity for all counselors to go. I really want Finance Committee to consider using $5 million of capital reserves. And then Finance Committee would consider that. Finance Committee members might move to change a recommendation at Finance Committee. And then Finance Committee would report back to the council on all the feedback it heard from the council on Monday. So if one counselor was going, <clears throat> I really wanna use $5 million of capital stabilization funds for this to reduce the debt exclusion, then Finance Committee could have considered that and either voted that in as part of their recommendation or not. And then they would have reported back to the council about why or why, why and why not they didn't make that, that part of their recommendation. So it's a double-edged sword. If we do things out of order, it can be confusing to both counselors and members of the public if you need more time, then there's an opportunity to ask for more time too. So Jennifer's saying, um, I'm Sorry, I'm not being very good, Alicia, at passing the microphone to, to Jennifer back and forth. I think we're getting into the weeds about this particular issue. Again, it's up to the president and the chair of a committee to decide how it wants to take things up. It's up to counselors to decide how it wants to deal with things. If you need more time, maybe we need to call a special meeting on Thursday night in order to meet that deadline. And I'm not suggesting that that would have been the right thing to do, but the group decides what the right thing to do is at every moment, okay? 
there was a hand over here. Yeah, the one thing that was um, one thing that was really um, important that happened was that the council as a whole, all of us together, asked a series of questions that needed to answer. And um, our finance director, uh, Sean, uh, then provided a series of answers which were presented to the finance committee and will be presented to the council. And that's important. And I, the reason I bring that up is that at any time, um, if we're in discussion, Athena, and counselors feel that they need more information to make a decision and the information is not before them, then what is the appropriate action for the counselor to take in order to obtain that information in order to have a more informed discussion? Kathy, are you looking to answer that question? You want to add to the question? The answer is yes. Um, so I was glad Andy said that because if you look at the agendas that we've been doing in finance, it was gathering questions and looking at impacts and including one of those questions was what would happen if we remo removed a million dollars from the debt exclusion you know so we were getting information that led to some of this so i really encourage using that process um andy had put debt authorization on the february 28th agenda on the March X agenda on the March 20th agenda, and it's on the March 28th agenda. So, I mean, it's a series of opportunities. So I think encouraging that. So it feels to me when you say, I don't think it was inappropriate what you said. I think it was encouraging what are the ideas we're putting on the table. Often what we'll do is ask a committee to consider certain questions and Committee chairs often reach out to counselors and say, if you have questions, if there's something you want us to seek information about, if you want to come to a committee meeting and speak during public comment to pose your questions, if you want to ask Paul for more information from our finance committee, from our finance director, those are all options as well. Um, I just would like to come back to something Lynn asked earlier about the charter right to postpone. And this is actually more for the bike rack. Um, if we, I don't know if we, if we're starting a bike rack or a, a parking lot or whatever. Um, but it seems to me that the charter right to postpone is the only measure in which the majority of the council is not required to move an action forward. Um, and because we're a deliberative body, um, it is the majority that moves actions forward. Um, so I don't. I question if that provision is a state law or if it was just included in our charter. I've tried to do some quick research and I couldn't get a good answer. So I'd like for us to put that into the parking lot for a future discussion. Your question is if a right to postpone is in the state law? The charter is the law. The charter provision is the law for Amherst. Is law. So Michelle's question is, can we change that provision in the charter that allows one member a right to postpone? <clears throat> the council can't do that by itself. There's going to be a charter review committee that will be formed on every year that ends in four. And there will be a process for evaluating the charter, figuring out just like we're doing with the rules, what works, what isn't working with public input. And then they will propose changes to the charter. And those changes need to be voted on by the town. So right now, the charter grants every individual counselor the right to say, we need to stop and take more time. Yeah. 
Yes. Lynn, let me bring over the mic. I'm glad that you asked that, and I'm glad that we clarified that it's particular to the Amherst Charter, because this relates directly to what Dorothy was asking, and that is somebody do, somebody makes that motion or makes that statement that, you know, I'm going to exercise my right to postpone, and it ends the discussion. And what Dorothy was asking earlier on this very same issue, does it have to end the discussion? And the answer is right now, based on our charter, it does. And so... I always feel mean when I do that, and Dorothy feels offended, but there you go. So the right to postpone is about the motion that's on the floor, and like we said earlier, the discussion is about the motion that's on the floor. So if we postpone the motion on the floor, either by the group or by an individual counselor, then there's nothing to discuss because we've moved that motion, we've moved the motion that's on the floor to a future meeting. There's also something that I did not do during at least one of those times, and I did not turn to the person who made the motion and said, would you like to make a comment? And that was inappropriate for me not to do that, so that whoever's president now or in the future, I hope they'll do that. Alicia, please go ahead. Um, I just had a question about the charter review because you said if we didn't want something or we wanted this rule to be addressed or changed that there would have to be a review of the charter and I'm just wondering is that something that happens or is that something that like we would have to set forth a process in order for that to happen or do we already have people who re review the charter on a regular basis or would the council have to like form a charter review commission or what would that look like? Every year that ends in four. 2024 will have a charter review commission to review the charter and make recommendations, which the council would then vote to put on a ballot for Amherst voters to approve or not. So changes to the charter are, um, they are recommended by that charter review commission every year that ends in four. That's always, that's in the charter. So that's four. every 10 years? Right, every 10 years. And is that something that is possible to change or that would only be able to change under the review that would happen in the year ending in four if they made that decision? Like if we think 10 years is too long to wait to review, is that something that we can decide or that would have to be a decision made by the review? So the charter itself requires a review every 10 years. It's section, I don't know, nine point. Six. Um, um, so you can read that section in the charter to see who forms it and all. I think the council forms the review commission and does the appointments to it. Um, there's some language in the charter for that. The charter can be amended any in accordance with state law. That's part of the charter. So if there's other state law provisions on how to amend, it can also be amended that way. That does not necessarily require a charter review commission, but the state law is very specific on ways to amend a charter. Thank you. In fact, when we get to priorities of the council, one of those priorities that is presently on our slate for this year is to develop a charge for that committee and a process for appointment of that committee. And uh, so that as soon as we reach 2024, which is this coming January, that committee can get started. Uh, just for people's information, if you are not on the League of Women Voters mailing list, the League of Women Voters has put out a call that if anyone has ideas, start they, they've started to think of gathering them, you know, so in advance of an official commission. So there is a, you know, they wouldn't be official. They just have put out a call. You have all received that because I asked them to forward it to all counselors. However, it's something they do as part of an, a, a, an association, a group, but they are not the official group reviewing the charter. They will weigh in during that review. And when 
um, I got the email from Phyllis Lira asking me to forward that. I asked her instead to forward it to the full council. Thank you for those comments. I think this is, I think it's helpful. I hope you all think this is helpful. There's just one more thing I wanna say about the charter right to postpone and postponements in general. The rules are based on a regard for rights. Each individual counselor has the right right now, according to the charter, to postpone something. How you all take other people exercising their rights is up to you. But we all have those rights, okay? If there aren't any other questions, I think we're ready to move on. Alicia, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not in front of my computer, so I can't always see your hand. Pamela's been helping me out looking for your hand. You're good. Everybody else, good. Okay, the consent agenda. There were some questions about this, so I think it's good to clarify what the consent agenda is for and how we use it. Here from our rules, matters eligible for the consent agenda are listed here. Counselors can ask questions or reflect uh, request clarification after the motion to adopt the consent agenda is made and before the vote is taken. So if you have a quick question about something that's on the consent agenda, bring it up then. We have on the consent agenda um, an approval to uh, use the public way for the farmer's market. Somebody have a quick question about what happens when there's another event on the comment? Let's ask that question before we vote on the consent agenda. So we don't have to bring up that and have a separate vote later. Now it's up to you if you wanna do that or not, but you're allowed to according to the rules. Um, something else I'd like to say about consent agenda is <clears throat> what's routine and non-controversial is to the best of our knowledge, we don't always know what's not going to be controversial until we get to a meeting. Lynn, she's nodding. So if there is something that we discover that the president or a counselor discovers is controversial and we want to have a full discussion about it, everybody has a right without a second to say, I'm going to take this off consent agenda. And my personal opinion is that that shouldn't be a judgment. We thought when we made the agenda that it wouldn't be controversial, we discovered that it's controversial, and now we're going to take it off consent agenda. At times, we've discovered that it's controversial, and Lynn's asked me to amend the agenda. At times, we haven't, when we know that somebody's going to take something off consent agenda. You don't have to amend the agenda to take something off the consent agenda. It can happen at the meeting. But everybody has a right to pull something, and what goes on it is to the best of our knowledge when we set that agenda, which is several days ahead of the council meeting. Questions about consent agenda? If a counselor chooses to use that right to pull something off the consent agenda, and we're talking about meeting management, and perhaps that's gonna um, create a longer meeting than was anticipated, is there what would be the method to saying okay we're going to remove this but we're going to move it to a future agenda because we don't have time to cover this today that's a good question that you could bring up during the meeting i like to remove this from the consent agenda and when it when we come to it during the discussion i'm going to move to postpone it to the next meeting Could we have, I'll call it an informal policy rather than a, we're writing it into our rules, that anything that's a substantive change would not go on an ascent content agenda. So sort of addressing the flip side, we need to at least hear what this is, think about it before we just move on it. So we would give informal guidance to the president. So. We'd have to look at if, if it's, a, and I'm using the word substantive, so in whose judgment is it substantive, it is clearly there, but, you know, approving a resolution, um, which we all already sent to GOL, there's implied uh, approving minutes since they're used to 
those of you who remember the first year of the council, we actually used to spend an hour or so editing the minutes during the meeting, word by word. So it was relief to have them go on the consent agenda. But I'm just thinking that if that was informal guidance, just look at it. And this is actually more than just, uh, you know, get it to GOL or get it to another place, another council committee. So what gets referred, what someone might consider substantive and what somebody else might consider substantive might be two different things. It, again, it's a judgment call. So if something's on con consent and counselors feel we need to have more of a discussion before we automatically refer this, and we're going to come back to this again later about how we run meetings and how much time we need to think about something and the criteria that we're going to use for evaluating our priorities, and that's going to speak directly to this issue. Because what we're hoping to do later is develop a set of criteria so the council can ask itself, we've all agreed on this set of criteria. This is how we're deciding how much time we spend on something, how much resources we spend on something with the few months that you have left of your terms. So if something comes up for a referral, Lynn makes a call that, it, you know, yep, we're going to refer it in consent to a committee for them to look at. Pull it off the consent agenda, have a conversation. Do we need a com committee to talk about this before we refer to a committee to have a hearing? Because I think that's what you're getting at. I'm going to go to Dorothy because. Okay. Uh, I just want to say that um, uh, we pulled off things off the consent agenda many, many times for just minor reasons. Uh, and certainly when I've done it, I haven't said where it should go or when. Um, and Lynn has done that because often she'll say, this one thing has to be dealt with with a certain time frame and because that's one reason why something might be on the consent agenda so um I, I haven't seen any problem in taking things off the consent agenda we're just really talking about the most recent instance when something seemed different from most items that were on the consent agenda though we do understand that one of the purposes of the consent agenda is if possible to reduce meeting time but this one kind of backfired and it increased the meeting time I totally agree. The council might agree as a group that referrals aren't good for the consent agenda because the council needs to have a discussion about the criteria and decide how much resources we want to spend on something before it gets referred to a committee to spend their resources on, their time and resources. So that could be something that the committee, that the council decides, you know, we want to be more, we want to be more thoughtful about where we send things before Pat and Jennifer. I have the talking piece. So we want to be more, we, that could be a decision that the council makes. We don't want to do referrals and consent agenda because we want to be more thoughtful about how we spend our time and resources. And when something comes up for referral, that's the opportunity that we have a conversation about how much time and resources we want to spend on something before it automatically goes to a committee. And I'm not saying that I'm advocating for one thing or another, but that's a conversation that the council can have about its rules. Questions? Did you want to share your comments with the group? <laughs> All right, my clicker stopped working, so. Where's my mouse going? Pam? So just to clarify for myself, if there's something that comes off the consent agenda, um, let's say I have the opportunity to say, I'd like to see this referred to a committee or I'd like to discuss this more, um, I'm really not sure what um, what the opportunities are to deal with it other than normally discuss it like we might when it comes off consent agenda. Is there anything different than taking it off consent agenda and then discussing it as usual? Can we take something off consent agenda just to have more of a discussion about it? No, that's exactly what I'm saying. 
I'm saying if we want to have a conversation about how we're using our time and energy and resources about something before we refer it to a committee, let's have that. My suggestion is let's have that conversation before we refer it. So, so the other referrals aren't the only thing on consent. We put substantive issues on consent that come out of committee after having been referred to committee for a recommendation, but they come out of committee unanimously. And so I think one thing we need to remember from my perspective is the consent is a way for us to save time for a way when if all of us are going to vote yes on that substantive matter, well, we can finish it in consent and get out of our meeting earlier, um, you know, without necessarily with potentially recognizing as a council that we don't have to make our statement on every single issue we vote on. Um, so, you know, I, I always try to think of consent personally as even if I want to make a statement, am I going to vote yes? Well, if I'm going to vote yes, maybe I don't need to make that statement. Maybe I can leave it on consent. Am I going to seek a motion to amend? Well, if I want to amend it, I pull it off of consent because I have another motion to make. Am I going to vote no? Do I not actually agree with the recommendation that came out of committee? Well, if I'm going to vote no, then it needs to come off consent because if I'm if it stays on consent, I'm a yes vote. So that's how I think of consent. People might think of it differently, but I really try to think, do we need to talk about it? Do I need to talk about it even if I'm going to vote yes? Well, not necessarily if I'm going to vote yes. So. I think linking the the criteria is would it be routine and non-controversial? Um, and because it comes out of a committee with a unanimous vote, doesn't necessarily mean that it will be that it will be non-controversial. So I think that's the piece that for each of us as counselors, the onus is on us not to see the consent agenda and just assume, oh, must all be routine and non-controversial, um, but to actually look at, and I think that the rules, uh, per, the rules review that we're doing is a really good example of that because we are trying to move through a big body of work and get things, you know, changed as GOL is recommending them, but it, it's also important for us as individual counselors to look at what has been recommended and not assume that to me or to someone else it would be non-controversial. And again, what's, what's non-controversial is a judgment call. And so if we think it's not, when we're putting the agenda together, know that it doesn't automatically happen at a meeting. It's not automatically done. Everybody has a right to pull something. And so there shouldn't be an assumption that just because it's listed on the consent agenda doesn't mean that we can't talk about it. Our most recent mishigash is surfacing everywhere. Um, the, um, the recommendation from GOL was unanimous. Uh, if you go back and look at the tape, it was, um, um, I think Lynn said, let's we'll get it on the consent agenda, but we weren't all thinking about every detail at that point. Um, and so that recommendation was also unanimous from every counselor who was at the GOL meeting. What happened for me is I realized, whoa, this is gonna be a mess and it's an important mess. So I pulled it from the consent agenda, even though it had come from GOL. And I think that we need to, um, no, I'm gonna stop there. Grace, grace is a value that everyone in this room has, and on Zoom, has agreed is a value of the entire council. And so if there's a judgment call that you don't agree with, let's give each other some grace. I don't know why my clicker isn't working. Ooh, here's some fun stuff. So to have a conversation about how many votes it takes, Mandy's already looking, real, looking forward to this conversation so much. <clears throat> we need to know what a measure is. 
The charter defines the measure as any bylaw, order, resolution, or other vote or proceeding adopted or that the council might adopt. Crystal clear. The rules has some definitions of, the, of a measure as orders, new bylaws or a change in bylaws, policies or regulations, resolutions, proclamations, and citations, financial actions, town manager appointments, other adopted proceedings. Pam, you're shaking your head. I don't think so. Is a motion to refer an adopted proceeding? I don't think so. Is a motion to amend an adopted proceeding? I don't think so. That's not a main motion. So when the council is taking a final action on something is when I would say it's a measure. We're gonna talk about what it means to abstain because we need to understand what it, mean, what it means to abstain to understand how to calculate votes. An abstention means you are present and not participating in the vote. So in the rules, it says present and voting, present and not voting, or majority present, majority present and voting. It also says abstentions count and abstentions don't count, which just my brain doesn't want to understand th that this way. So we're gonna talk about figuring out how all those things are calculated in a minute. But abstain means I'm present and I'm not participating in the vote, not voting. Raise your hand and stop me if something isn't clear. There are some things that are very clear how many votes it takes. It takes 10 yay votes to appoint a former councilor to a paid town position within one year of serving on the council. If there are nine councilors in a room, this just can't be approved. If there are eight councilors in the, the room when a unpaid bill from a previous fiscal year comes up, then it can't be approved but with eight councilors because it needs nine. Is that eight counselors that vote yes and one abstains? Is there an abstention in that formula? We need nine yay votes. Nine yays. So we need nine people to say yes. It doesn't matter if there's no's or abstentions, we need nine people to say yes in order to pass those. If somebody's absent, we still need nine, okay? We need seven yays for this many. Oh, Dorothy, sorry, didn't see your hand. So looking at this from the printed sheet, I see that for me, under nine yay votes, some zoning changes. Under seven, yay vote, some zoning changes. And that's really, yeah, this is crucial stuff. I'm just gonna give you a moment to memorize this. I make jokes when I'm nervous, um, but I'm trying to reframe nervousness as excitement. So I make jokes when I'm really excited. These are the things that require a simple majority. These are the zoning changes that require a simple majority. They're in your printed mat materials. Alicia, I will send you a printed copy or a digital copy. This is state law. So when I say some zoning changes, it's everything not on that list. Seven yay votes is everything on that list. Or when state law says something else. So there might be a new state law that changes the quantum of vote on something else. So we go by the state law. I'm, I'm just offering a comment on when that state law changed, it was to make it easier for towns to pass zoning. And there was a lot of opposition to that change, but we, as Athena said, we have to live under state law. So, so the change happened and it made the world much more complicated. <laughs> So the one other thing I just want to ask, um, I think this is very helpful as you go through it and what an abstain is. I kind of 
I don't know whether people notice, I always say yes, because most of us in normal conversation don't say Y-E-A. Um, so just yes votes would be, but when we are voting on something that's lower level than zoning, I think it would be really helpful before a vote, you warn people that if they abstain, their vote doesn't count, all right? That an event, because that's not always true. Sometimes the abstention really matters. You can kill something because it needs seven or because it needs nine. In other cases, you can't. So glad that you brought that up because we're gonna to get to that. And what I've been doing, I don't know if you noticed, but on the motion sheets lately and recently, I've been trying to indicate that above each motion. Okay, and I had been putting abstentions count, abstentions don't count. And again, my brain just doesn't want to understand it that way. I'm going to phrase it a different way and hopefully that helps. But if the way it's written in the rules works for you, then that works for you. Okay, so we all know this by heart. Here's what requires two thirds of the counselors present and voting, spending from a stabilization fund and other actions that require two thirds present and voting by law. So here's what it looks like. <clears throat> if there are 13 counselors present and three abstentions, then there are only 10 counselors voting. And we need two thirds of that 10 to pass that. If there are 11 counselors present and two abstentions, there are nine counselors voting, present and voting. So we need six votes. A majority. Sorry, go ahead. So in a worst case scenario, if only seven of us showed up, which is a quorum, it would be, it could pass with as little as four. If someone abstained, I mean, if I kept doing the math down, <laughs> what? No, no, no. So it, if it keeps, so when we don't show up at a meeting, the number keeps getting smaller and smaller, and then an abstain can kill it. Um, I mean, cannot kill it. It, it can help, it can help, it can help it pass with a lower number. So this to me is a warning about abstaining. I'm hoping that you come away with an understanding of what abstentions mean. It means you're here and you're not participating. And that means that a fewer number of you get to make that decision. I'm sorry. I know that uh, we all have the right to abstain, um, but are there some practical reasons why one might abstain from a vote? I'm sure there are 13 different reasons in any given situation why someone may or may not abstain. Yes, for a variety of reasons. So Michelle's saying that, that it's a struggle sometimes to understand what abstaining is and isn't. And that's why I'm trying to give you this guide so that you understand when you're abstaining, what that does. And sometimes when you abstain, that means that a fewer number of you can approve something. And sometimes it doesn't. So we're gonna go over that a little bit more. I was saying, I think I answered my own question, but if I recuse myself and I leave the room, how does that affect the two thirds? Excellent question. When you recuse yourself and leave the room, that's one less counselor present. You're absent for the vote. I think I saw Anna's hand first and then I'm gonna come back to you, Kathy. I think to Michelle's point, one of the things, it, it reminded me of what we were just talking about before, right? When we think about abstentions and, and abstaining because you feel you don't have enough information, I think that's why we have all of those other mechanisms when we that we just talked about with motions to pause or or delay or whatever it is to get to that point where you have enough information. And so I think it's they I mean it's it's an ecosystem. They all play together. But I, I think that for me, one of the reasons why I have heard or I have abstained is because I felt that I didn't have the information required to vote. And in those instances, we do have mechanisms in place to get that information. And I think for me, it was a good reminder to use those. And another reminder that if we need to take a moment so that we all have clarity about what's being voted and what your votes mean, let's give ourselves permission to do that 
to take a moment so that everybody is on the same page before a vote is taken. I think we've only had one instance of it. So when Pat asked leaving the room, we had one time a counselor had to leave the room because there was a conflict of interest. Is there any provision, not that I can think of anything coming up, where enough of us have a conflict that we have to leave the room and then we don't, we're not gonna have enough votes to pass something. Does, there's no way out of these vote counts is I, th I think what I'm hearing you know, on the biggies, right? Yeah. There is a way around it, state law. And I didn't brush up on ethics before this conversation, but if you have a question like that, it's in the conflict of interest. I thought you weren't participating. Point of information. Um, so there, the state, there's a state law called rule of necessity that if there, if you if you fail to have a quorum because of the multiple conflicts, you can declare the conflicts and then uh, can participate. Thank you. Questions? I thought I saw more hands. Is that a state law? What's up there, or is that our charter? Some of these things are state law, and some are in the charter, which is our local law. So non bylaw measures. It's in the rules. Mm -hmm. So here's what a majority of counselors present looks like. <clears throat> a majority is seven. So if there are 13 counselors present and three counselors abstain, we're looking for the majority of 13 to pass something. Questions? A majority of counselors present and voting. Yes. In the previous one, abstention is like a no. Here's what present and voting. There's 11 counselors present. There are two, counts, two abstentions. Nine counselors are present and voting. So we need a majority of nine. This one might sound familiar. We need five because that's a majority of nine. Even though there are 11 counselors in the room. There are nine counselors present and voting. We would need five yay votes to approve something. Right. So if you don't reach five, then it fails. I'm, I'm slow on these things. Um, some of the times, if somebody abstains, they become invisible. But sometimes they don't. I, I need the clarification. That's exactly what I'm trying to explain here. If you remove yourself in this situation, if you abstain in this situation, you've let a smaller number of counselors decide that question. Because you're present and you're not participating, okay? You wanna share with the class? Pam? Please do. And I'm, I'm picking on you like this because if you're having questions or having a conversation, the group can benefit from it. So if you're asking, Let's let's ask together. So we're trying to recount the ZBA appointment discussion and um, that in fact, this majority presence says for town council appointments, town council appointment, majority present town council appointments. I'm reading that. In fact, I think it was voted in the in the form of majority present and voting, which would be incorrect. I'm reading directly from this sheet.
I'm I'd like to suggest we take a recess. <laughs> I want I want us all to be clear on this, so I'm just pulling up the rules here. Right. No, I'm sharing the wrong screen again. Just a minute, I wanna get clarity on this before we move on. <clears throat> Okay, we're gonna take a short break. The group has spoken, we need a break. Alicia, let's take five minutes, thank you.
Okay, folks, we're going to come back together. Please find your seats. We have lunch on the way, so we're tr just going to try and get through this last point before we grab a bite to eat. So let's grab our seats. Pat DeAngelis, I'm talking to you. You like it. <laughs> Just checking for Alicia. Alicia, are you back with us? Great, thank you. We're waiting for Dorothy and Kathy to come back. They're, they're here. We're gonna just come back together briefly and get, get through this portion. We're going to stop and grab a bite to eat and then come back and do a working lunch. Okay, Mandy, I'm gonna ask you to explain this. What am I explaining? The question that came up right before. So under the charter, a measure is defined as resolutions, proclamations, orders, and other adopted proceedings. Our rules have taken into that other adopted proceedings appointments. Uh, the rules committee and then the council when adopted the rules determined that appointments included other adopted proceedings and put that specifically in the rules measures under the charter must receive as long if they're not bylaws non bylaw measures under the charter must receive a majority of those present. And so when appointments has been deemed an other adopted measure an other adopted proceedings i.e. a measure. That means a vote on appointments must receive a majority of those present. So if 11 people are present and five vote in favor, four vote against, and two abstain, it fails because six is a majority of those present. Thank you. So if... Michelle's question is, could something like that be changed? So if the charter specifically defines something as a measure, we cannot change it only as a body unless we follow the rules on how to amend a charter. The charter has other adopted proceedings. I think KP Law has come out and said, we as a council can make a can define what that means. And right now our rules define appointments as other adopted proceedings. It is in theory possible then for us as a body to amend the rules to remove the non-listed portions under measure in the charter from an other adopted proceeding that would have to follow the requirements of how to adopt changes to the rules of procedure, which right now is two thirds. Thank you for letting me pick on you. And for giving my voice a break. Hi, and uh, I'll just go back to I was on the drafting committee for the rules and did not read that clause carefully. We all we really have to do if we want to is move the word appointments to another category. And so I'm restating what Mandy said, because it's not listed, we can put that word anywhere we want. Um, and that's anywhere we want, whether we want to move it or not. But, but th that's where we have total leeway in the drafting. And there was a review of this by the first set of counselors. And I can tell you that that clause was never really discussed because we were much more on larger issues of where would public comment be, what would the committees be, you know, so this kind of getting down to 
uh, and it was largely because you didn't understand this vote count in the same way we've just had it explained. So it it's on page 24 or whatever of the rule. It's an easy fix if we want to fix it. And as Jennifer pointed out, it would make it consistent with filling a counselor vacancy, <laughs> which, you know, so, 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 so filling a counselor vacancy is a huge deal, but it's at a lower level, so it would make it consistent. So that's just a, a point on, it's a, it's a wording change, not a, that is policy related, but it's one that's in our power. Thank you for adding that. The council reviews its rules every year. So we get to talk about this every year. GOL gets to talk about it. Counselors can provide input to GOL about what changes they'd like to make. GOL will have a conversation and vote. That may or may not be controversial when it comes back to the council. And um, another point that I wanted to make is something that I'm trying to remember right now. And we'll come back to it. Um, we're going to take a short break so that everyone can grab some lunch, but I'm going to ask you to bring your lunch back to your seat so that we can keep going through lunch. We have still quite a bit of conversation to have before um, the end of the day. And we want to make best use of our time. So please take, can we do it in five? Can we, take, can we grab lunch in five minutes? Let's take five minutes to grab something to eat and then come back to your seats. Thank you all.
we have just about a minute before five minutes are up. So please finish gathering your lunch and come back. I have a feeling that most of us are gonna wanna leave our cameras off so that we're not watching each other chew. But we have the wide angle, we have the wide angle cameras of the room. And so we can all see that we're still here. But if you feel more comfortable not chewing on camera, I think we can all appreciate that. So just a minute or two to finish gathering your lunch and then we'll and then we'll get back to it. All right, we're just finishing up and coming back to our seats. Who's in trouble back here, Anna and Kathy? <laughs> Alicia, I just want to make sure you're still with us. It's I can understand if you want to leave your camera off while you're eating, but you can hear us. We can hear you. We're good. Okay, thank you. Is everyone, is everyone back? We're all back. All right, folks, we're gonna get back to it. <clears throat> we still have quite a bit to cover. The last thing I'd like to say about that portion on the rules is about my role to serve you. And I just wanna say <clears throat> that all of these can be really confusing. I don't expect everyone to memorize the rules. I don't expect everyone to memorize Robert's rules. I do expect that we allow ourselves moments to seek clarification when we need them. For me to take a moment to check if you're asking for an answer, 99 times out of 100, if someone asks me a question, the first thing I do is turn to the charter and the rules. Right now, we had a question about the quantum of vote. The first thing I did was come over and open the rules and take a, take a look before we moved on. If someone has a question about how to make a motion, if someone has a question about how to use the rules or anything like that, I'm here to help. I'm an impartial part of this process. So if someone has a question about a motion that they wanna make, whether or not I think it's a good idea is not part of my advice to you. So I just wanna offer that and say my door is open. And I thank you for tolerating my advice when you don't ask for it. So I'm gonna pass the mic finally to Pamela. Right. 
Right, so we're gonna give Athena just a tiny bit of a break. Um, and I just wanted to uh, have you think about what we started with, which was the concept of appreciative inquiry. The next substantive session that you're going to um, delve into, uh, ask the questions, how can you make your meetings more efficient? And that has the potential to be a highly charged conversation. But if you think about um, the concepts of appreciative inquiry, in appreciative inquiry, we're asking you to start from a foundation of positive, looking back, but only looking back at what was positive so that you can bring that forward. I also think it's really important as you enter the next conversation to think about the values um, that were established for the town council. And so I just want to give you a brief example of, um, of a challenge that someone might think about um, using appreciative in inquiry. So uh, Shalini, you don't, do you mind if I put you on the spot a little bit? Okay, so asked if we could provide an example of what a question might look like for appreciative inquiry. And so when I looked at your values, there's one that I'm gonna take um, objection to. So, and it's the very last one which says tolerance. We value the expression of diverse perspectives even when we don't agree with them and we don't put our own perspectives above others. So, you know, in general, I sort of agree with that statement, but I don't like the word tolerance. You know, as a person of color, I don't wanna be tolerated. I don't want my perspective to be tolerated. I want my perspective, my opinion to be respected. You know, I want to have equal say at the, at the, an equal stake at the table. So um, imagine that I have now made my opinions about that value to you as a group. How might you use appreciative inquiry to have a little bit of discussion about what my objection might be? How can we reframe the discussion so that it's positive, so that it builds on the strengths um, of the past action uh, and embody some of the other values that you've, that you've talked about? If we were actually in a meeting, I would probably um, said like to hear um, other perspectives on this and then, but, but I also want to acknowledge with you. So thank you for your honesty and for sharing that perspective, which I didn't think about. Um, is there another word that, <clears throat> that would speak to this idea or or I would like maybe share, okay, I'm like, I'm feeling like I'm in the spot right now. So I'm not thinking that clearly. So I'll just be honest right now. It's making me, I'm like shutting down. Um, but um, I think I would like a moment to think about it and then, um, and then come back. What I'd want to ask is I hear the, uh, the challenge with the word and are, what are there elements in the sentence that do feel like they resonate? Um, and is there a way that we can frame this that gets at the, what I believe the intent was, or is the intent part of the challenge as well? And so, so trying to figure out what are the elements that do work um, and how might we better capture that and, and demonstrate that, right? So, yeah, okay. That's a perfect, right? Reframing, thinking about coming from a point of strength. So my response would be, well, you know, in general, I really like the idea that the town council has expressed a value of um, wanting to hear diverse perspectives and acknowledging that, you know, individuals with diverse perspectives may not agree. It's just that that word tolerate really, um, you know, feels like a punch in the stomach. So I would love to think about how we could do that differently. I don't know which way. Um, I've noticed that the second word is value, but sometimes value can be positive or negatively. So I, I would like to 
rename it instead of tolerance, because tolerance means kind of put up with, right? Um, go through the motions, uh, but appreciate, appreciate learning from difference and different points of view. That sounds much better. I think this is great because I would, you could change the word tolerance to perspective. And if you put Dorothy's in, we appreciate or we welcome diverse perspectives. It's that each of us may come with a different way of looking at something and perspective is necessary when you're thinking about how is the other, what is their point of view? Um, so allow time. So I agree with getting rid of the word tolerance. It's different. It's a very different meaning. I like the word perspective because I think when you hear the word perspective, you automatically think that there's going to be multiple perspectives, right? So your art, your mind is already thinking that there are going to be multiple ways of looking at that issue. So this was meant just to be a little example of how you might use appreciative inquiry. Now, you know, obviously in the moment in a town council meeting, uh, it might be difficult to sort of uh, to do this. But I think what Athena has said time and time again, and what each of you said in response to the first question about what you value most about your work on the council and when you have worked well has been listening. And listening requires a pause. So I th one of the things that I would suggest that you do in the future, right, for what it's worth coming from me, my opinion, is to allow yourself to pause. The pause will allow you that little bit of time to think about what's before you, to uh, understand it. Um, and one thing that I would say in the last exercise that we saw when we were going through the um, the discussions and the explanations about the rules and the motions, you all come to this with very different skills and backgrounds. You have to allow yourself the time to make sure everyone fully is, understands, gets what's being said, and gets what the consequences of that before you move forward. I mean, you are an elective body who represents the entire community and has to work for the folks in your district, but also for the entire community. Um, so you have to just keep that in mind as you're working collectively. How can I approach this in a positive way? How can I reframe the question? Um, what are the values that we as a town council want to bring to this discussion? So I'm going to pause there, and we're going to go back to some of the heavy stuff. Thank you. So this is going to be, we're going to brainstorm, <clears throat> talk about rules and procedures, and keeping in mind what Pamela just said, what works, and what can we bring more of into the future in terms of how we run our meetings, how can we make them efficient, and how can we make sure that people's voices are heard, that we move effectively through actions and so on. So this is, the floor is open for you all to share. I'm gonna take some notes while we're sharing about what works. This might come out as maybe something that we want GOL to look at. Maybe it's just a shared understanding that we all feel more comfortable slowing down when we need to slow down. <clears throat> so I'm not saying that we need to send a list to GOL, but we're just thinking about what works and putting together some ideas about what works best. What can we take from the rules and meeting procedures into the future? What can we take about what works in the rules and in our meeting procedure, learn from our past experiences of meetings? When have we finished a meeting before 9.30? <laughs> that we can bring into the future? Or maybe something that we just went over today that you'd like to bring into the future with the goal? With the goal of making your meetings more um, efficient, right? You're, you're thinking about ways in which you can use the rules to your benefit to get through your agenda in a more efficient way. So um, 
I think certainly having an understanding of the rules will do that, but think about other things. And we, and this is your brainstorming. So this is when we get to run around and be Vanna. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for being the first. Um, I think this is, this has been mentioned several times by other counselors, but that um, we don't all necessarily need to comment on everything. And one of the methods I think that I have tried to use, and this is the kind of deeper part that I wanted to put out there is um, like to say, I support X counselor as a way of sharing that without a whole statement on my own position, but how do we do that without becoming like binary or polarized? You know, if I am, or personalized, I guess, you know, so that's the sort of tension that I sit with sometimes is if I'm not saying my unique view and if I can just say, well, I agree enough with Mandy on that, that I'll, I'll just say, I support what Mandy says. How does that not become a personal um, matter within the dynamics of the council? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, this was just more a comment because I sometimes struggle with this that I don't maybe have a very different opinion than a lot of what's being said, but I do, I, I actually worry, I get self-conscious that I'm appearing disengaged to people that are watching from the outside, even my constituents. I don't want them to think I'm, I don't know, doing my grocery list, you know, because I haven't spoken. Um, and that's why, you know, I sometimes I'll say at the end, you know, I agree with you know, so, you know, another counselor, because I don't want to, so I think that's maybe a bit what, I don't know if we all struggle with it, but if we each speak for two or three minutes on every issue, there's 13 of us, that's a lot of time. But I do sometimes find if I haven't spoken in a while, I'm feeling a little self-conscious. I don't want people think to think I'm not engaged. I just maybe really don't have anything, you know, new to add to what's been said. Thank you. Um. Sort of in response to Jennifer, I think I speak the least in council meetings. Uh, no, Kathy's saying that's not true. <laughs> so perspective, um, <clears throat> I usually wait because I am really listening. Um, and so I really would appreciate a couple of things. I think I know when I speak, sometimes I repeat myself. Um, and I know I'm speaking spontaneously, uh, but uh, if one of the things that I think is endemic to the council is a repetition of what you've already said. So if we could find a way to keep it simple and direct and trust that that will be heard, I think that could be very valuable. Um, Um, it's a process question for right now, but I think it's a similar question I always have in meetings. Like Michelle started with a question and then we went to another comment, which was totally unrelated. And then we go on and I don't feel like we're really listening and acknowledging what's being shared and responded to. So it feels like we go from topic to topic and everyone just wants to get their question out there or their comment without really creating that pause and acknowledging. And so as a process right now, and then in council, how do we do that in a way that it's, you know, me, I mean, maybe the idea is that we hear different people and then cluster the same questions together and address them, or are we taking one at a time? But to me, many times it feels like we're not being heard. You're asking if we want to have a conversation. OK. I, I imagine this is a brainstorm about you know what you want to do and, and what comes out of it might come out naturally. You know, I'm putting together a list. Does, do we need to codify these in the rules? Do we need to have more of a conversation about you know if everyone's taking time to comment or everyone feels like they need to comment, how do we address that as a group? So that's a question that's out there and it's up for the group to say, you know, 
we need to have a shared understanding. How do we hold ourselves accountable if we have a shared understanding? So this is just part of the conversation. So, yep. So then the process question for now is the purpose of right now is to just collect questions and, and, and questions and comments, but not have a conversation and not answer them. Let's listen openly, let things arise as they arise. And then if something arises that's going in your mind, you know what, I have an idea about how we can do this, then let that come up and share it, okay? So we're having, if the question is, I see lots of hands and I know that when hands are up, your brain turns off because you're trying to keep your thought in your head. So if something that's arising that's going, I, I have an idea about how we can deal with that better, Let's let that arise. Let's do it. Let's have a conversation. Let's come up with ideas. Let's figure out what works. Let's have a conversation about how we might bring that into the future. Just like Pamela's example about how to make changes and, and what's arising from what works in that statement and what we want to change. I, I know Kathy's been waiting, so I'm going to come over here first. Hey, I, I was trying to respond to a couple of things that have been said. Um, so one is we have an ability, if there's a point of debate where there are two different, that the president could say, I'm gonna give these two people time to talk to each other, you know, so that you don't have a need that the hand goes up because I only got half of what I wanted. So that's a possible way that we've already written into our rules saying allowing a debate. Um, the second observation is uh, building on what Jennifer said, that sometimes if you're totally quiet, you miss, this is a horrible thing to say, you miss the opportunity to be quoted in the Gazette. So, so there is, it's a political process. And if the more zinging you can be, the more likely you're gonna get a comment in. So we should, Resist that wherever it's necessary um, was my other thought. I'm going to challenge that a little bit because you are political. That's an inherent part of what you're doing. And so shutting somebody down because or or devaluing what they're sharing because you think they might be sharing it for a political reason. A lot of what you do is done for a political reason. So, you know, uh, letting each other being understanding about that <clears throat> and that you're all running for maybe some of you, maybe not all of you are running for re-election coming up here soon. And so you want to make statements in front of, in an audience like this. So I, I think it's not supposed to just be between you and us. I'm just reacting to, uh, there's a time we might want to do that, but three minutes times 13 makes 39 minutes, 30 minutes. So we should use it wisely. You know, we should just use it really wisely. And then I, so my one other uh, non-responsive one is that in setting the agenda, if there's clearly an issue that needs a lot of discussion, plan for that amount of time. You know, just and and it that's been increasingly done by the president saying, I think this is an hour long. But then I noticed in our uh, little cheat sheet on Roberts, uh, trying to honor that time limit if possible. And if we can't get through it in an hour, reschedule it for the next meeting. You know, to just try to think of, we've got to get through the other items too, and that, but not cut off debate to say, it's session one and session two would be a suggestion of a way of not having the meeting feel we have to leave. Sometimes we have to reach closure. Something that, I'll get to you in just a second. Something that I didn't mention from Robert's rules is a motion to limit debate. And there's been a lot of tension when people want to limit the debate and feelings that they're shutting down and so on. And it's up to individuals how they want to respond to those situations. But can we reach a shared understanding about needing our meetings to move? And there are some things that we need to deal with tonight. And how much time do we spend on this? Can we agree as a body how much time we want to spend on this? Do we want to limit debate? We can have a motion to limit debate to two minutes per person. You could have a motion to limit debate to half an hour. 
And then when that half an hour is up, if we haven't reached a resolution, maybe it goes to the next agenda. This is just something that's coming up for me right now. I'm not saying you all need to start making motions to limit de debate left and right, or that that's the right thing to do. But I just wanted to point out that that's, some, that's an option for you. <clears throat> I have a couple. Um, this is one of them is a message for me and that's limit the number of agenda items. The second one, however, is one that I probably am more guilty of than anybody else, and that is recognizing that my vote is an opinion and I don't need to speak to it. Um, and another one is to recognize by looking around and listening whether or not you think the votes have already been cast and how much more do you really need to say? I think Mandy had her hand up and then I'll come back to you, Dorothy. Lynn covered some of it. I think um, recognizing that if we have all decided we can stop talking, um, it's hard though, because as Jennifer said, we all sometimes just want to say something, but the, you know, and not needing to respond to every point that has been made, you know you can say your piece, but you don't necessarily have to continually respond to everything. Um, you know, I, I, the other thing I want to mention that no one has mentioned is getting off topic. I think we as a council get off topic a whole lot. Um, whether that's because we don't actually have a motion on the table to start with. So I think starting with something on the table helps but even when a motion to amend is on the table, say something else, we're sometimes not even talking about the amendment um, and what the motion is, I think will help us frame things. Well, I'm gonna to speak to uh, why we feel impelled or <clears throat> desiring to speak. And often, this is my point of view, it's not just what's happening in the room, because I'm very aware that um, I'm a representative, I represent my constituents, and I'm thinking about the real world outside and how I think that we and they and the town will be affected. And so um, I do that. And I tell you that when I go out into the world, people come up and say, you said what I was thinking. So. I, you know, we don't know, and Lynn points out, we don't know who's watching. We don't know how many are on Amherst Media watching on TV, but there are a lot of people who are watching, who are concerned, who care about things, and they do want to kind of get, have their point of view expressed. Um, and usually you can do that in much under three minutes, okay? But I do want to say on being on topic, okay, um, sometimes I don't like to stay on topic because I like creativity. And you know, when you're in a meeting, you get ideas. You, and this person's and that person's, and we get a cross influence and you get an idea. And I sometimes don't wanna lose those ideas. So I want us to be efficient or more efficient than we are, but I don't wanna be a cut and dried body where it's you go, you follow the rules, you do the thing, and then you say, what did I do? No, that's it. Are you going to talk about this? Okay. okay. So um, as I'm looking at the rules and I'm thinking about efficiency, one of the things that stands out to me is the opportunity to reframe how we think about referrals and how we think about the information and the input that we have on things that we refer. So I'm thinking about one, what it means to refer something to committee, right? Does that mean that we are saying it? So my, my opinion is that that means we are saying, we believe this is a good use of council time. We want a committee to discuss this, debate it, hash it out, figure it out, and then bring it back to us, right? Or is it just all right, I want to see a final version. So, okay, even though I'm not sure I agree with the topic. And so I think really kind of interrogating for ourselves what a referral means in that sense, um, because I, I actually think that we might be coming in with different ideas on that. Uh, I think some people, some of us are coming in saying like, well, we'll just refer it and then I'll decide if I like it when it comes back. And some people are saying, I do believe in this idea. I'm endorsing this idea. That's what I'm saying when I refer it. And so I think coming to a common understanding would be important. I also think that how we give input on measures uh, when they are referred, 
I think coming to a common understanding of that as well and thinking about with the water and sewer regs, it was really helpful to have folks go through, go through the document as a word document and then send it to the committee that was that was dealing with it. And that committee had tasked one per, me with kind of working through those comments. And so I think not needing to sit in a meeting of council to go through every detailed element, every comment of a measure that was getting referred and instead trusting our committee heads to receive those comments in a written capacity. Because I also think waiting until it's gone fully through a committee and then come back to council and then putting in comments that you had the first time around is is spending way more time than we need to when there's already been a lot of time spent. So I think where, and I'm, I'm not saying you can't have input the second time it comes back, obviously, of course you can, but offering input that first time to the committees, not necessarily in the full council, unless it feels that it needs to be debated and discussed, if that helps. Um, yeah, the, the thing that has concerned me about um, our making referrals to the committee is that we are deciding also that it is worth the time of the committees to spend on the issue and that it is an important issue that we're gonna to wanna to spend time when it comes back from the committee. And um, so we're making a decision that um, is an allocation of what is maybe our collective precious resource, our time. So when um, somebody proposes something, if it doesn't make a lot of sense, to us, whoever the us is, um, I think it's worth taking the time to do at least a little bit of plying about what is the purpose of this? What is the gain? How important is it? Because I think that we also need to evaluate the priority for use of time. I really appreciate that. And I think our conversation on criteria is going to speak directly to that because that will help us have a shared list of criteria to evaluate at the time something is referred. Is this where we wanna spend our time and resources? Is this how we wanna spend the town's resources and so on? So I really appreciate your comment. I appreciate everyone's comments. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Athena. Um, so I just wanted to add as, as uh, and not to repeat myself more than I will, as someone who just brought up the idea of us not repeating everything. <laughs> and in every meeting, I think, you know, part of that was also just the beauty of listening. Um, and, you know, I learn more about each of you through listening and conversation than I do your votes. Um, and I, I think also with constituents, that's why we're here. Um, and so I think with that also comes confidence, you know, when we come as prepared as we can um, and we're, you know, we might come thinking, you know, yes, we know that we're um, going to vote, um, how we're going to vote. But I think just that and also you're really appreciating what Andy just said and, and trust and committee members and, of course, speaking up when you do not agree. Um, but I hope that that's taken in, you know, Sometimes we can gain more from listening than we can speaking. Oh. That opens up a little bit of a murky area, though, when we get to discuss if perhaps it's a, a proposed bylaw, perhaps it's a topic without <clears throat> without we're all saying a short conversation about it before it gets referred is a very gray area because um, it may be something that's totally new to us. We don't have any sense at all about the ramifications. We don't have a sense of perhaps even the workload that we would be asking a committee to undertake. Um, I know there are different reasons to refer. In some cases, I know I have said, sure, go, re go refer it to the committee. Let them, you know, let them spend the 10 or 15 or half an hour discussing this, does it have merit? 
is this something that they want to come back to us? It feels like there could be an interim step where the committee has an, an inkling of how they want to handle it, that they could perhaps report back sooner than a full-fledged zoning bylaw um, uh, um, in action takes place. So what I'm hearing is that maybe sometimes a referral is to ask a committee to consider how much time it's gonna take to do the whole thing. Is it worth it to the committee? And is it worth it to the council to explore the just that initial question? Let's take a look at how much time we think this is gonna take, how many resources, what the resources are. Anna. Unless there's somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Okay, we're following the rules. I think that gets back to the idea of the criteria too, because I think we also don't wanna have everything have to get voted to refer twice, right? And so I think that it, it would be interesting to, um, to consider how that might, I, I appreciate those questions, right? And I think that that's something that we should make sure to include when we get to criteria to say things like time it would take, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of level of evolution, like where it is and it's, it's kind of development um, should also be in, in criteria to refer in the first place as, as well or instead, yeah. The, the, the other side of that coin is that um, there's been, there have been conversations about, well, just, you know, just vote it down before it even gets referred. It's possible to vote something down on the floor. It does not have to be referred. And I think I tend to, I tend to be more lenient in, well, maybe there's something of that that's worthwhile. There's a nugget of good in it. The rest is really extraneous. But how do you how do you how do you discover the nugget if you've killed it on the floor? Um, even though sometimes I would, I mean, it it hasn't occurred to me necessarily to kill it on the floor. It is an option. Uh, I've been thinking about the protecting the majority, protecting the minority in terms of referral. One I've never thought I could vote against a referral because it always seemed like a good idea. So that's singing in my brain. But the other piece is if, a, if there are two people on a five person committee who feel strongly about something being implemented and three who don't, is there not some way for those, that minority in this instance to have, uh, to take time, you know, if we agree that we wanna pursue it um, on on an outside of a meeting and then bring it back to the committee why why would that not be something that could happen to protect the uh, minority um, it just seems important to me I guess that's probably the other reason I always refer because I think things need to be looked at but maybe we can make some kind of mini committees subcommittees within committees based on um, I don't know, opinion or something. Creating a committee is also a decision to allocate resources, right? Yep. So um, it's interesting everyone gravitated to referrals because that is some of the smallest and least time consuming things our council does during a six hour council meeting. Um, we, we talk a lot about things we have final votes on. Um, and so some of the things that have struck me over my four years on the council is we've gotten a lot better and this is kudos to staff and pushing of our leadership to staff to have memos that describe action, memos that describe everything, the reports from the committees on reporting out that include a lot of the discussion more extensive than say minutes or when committees talk over it for five or six meetings, you have to condense that into one memo. Those memos and then making sure we all read those memos, I think gives us, and that preparation time is so important because I think it can cut down on the amount of discussion we have or the questions we have. One thing I've taken 
advantage of sometimes is emailing Paul some questions ahead of time on things that I was like, oh, I don't like this. I'd want to mend it, but is there a reason why it's this way? And and Paul's and his staff have been very good at getting back to me sometimes. That has then saved me pulling something from consent sometimes because um, I got that question answered. So I think we have to take a little bit more responsibility on ourselves to prepare for meetings, committee chairs and all, um, and staff and all having the memos that are complete. And then in some sense, trusting our committees. And it's something I'm trying better to do when something comes out of a committee five zero um and that committee and and you know who is on that committee it's not always an automatic right but if you know that discussion was very full full and very diverse in opinions and all trusting that they probably covered all of your questions and made it to a unanimous recommendation for a reason. Now that's not always the case, right? We saw an example where it was not the case, but I would argue we actually didn't have a very good discussion in committee. So it might've been, and, and Jennifer was absent, but it might've been a problem of the committee too. Um, but, you know, taking that step back and saying, did this committee spend the time and do I trust their opinion? Um, this is about repeating stuff. And I think what I'm hearing and which I go through is the tension between uh, being effective and efficient with our time, but also feeling that the public hears what we have to say. And so going back to the question that Michelle had, like that, how do we just second what someone said and let people know, because I find it helpful to know who's voting, how and why, not how, but why are they voting? So I think if we can all agree to just share that, I, I do wanna hear how everyone's voting. And if you just say it with one statement, that I agree with what Michelle said because I really value our time together. All right, so you just say it in one, but don't repeat the whole three minutes thing. So that's one thing. And the second thing I was thinking is like our shared intention as a council, you know, when we are working together to make decisions and this is not a political campaign, I think that, and we've all shared that intention that we care about our community. We care about the decisions and how it's impacting our community. If you hold that intention very clearly that what is going to be better for the community, me making that three minute statement or letting that pass and getting to the decision. So just internally holding that intention always clearly is helpful to me. So I, I think I just want to summarize some of the points and I'm not going to get repeat all of them that I heard that I think will be really helpful for you as you're thinking about the efficiency of your meetings. So um, not responding to all uh, points, um, staying on topic, uh, starting with a motion, um, uh, having notes, keeping it simple and direct, listening. Uh, setting the agenda, um, making sure that you um, have limits on the agenda items, okay. and uh, oh, recognizing that if if a decision has been made, that you know there's no need to continue talking uh, talking about it. Um, I think um, stating your purpose. Is, um, and when you're making a motion or ha having some resolution or having discussion, like if you are really clear about why you're doing it and um, what you think the impact will be, having that direct conversation will be very helpful for not only the public that's listening in, but also for your colleagues who are then going to be asked to vote on it. 
Uh, so being direct and simple, I mean, this is a conversation that's really happening in multiple ways. Like you're having the conversation with yourselves and you're also having the conversation with the community who in your various districts are listening in and, and I would say are expecting action um, from you and want to know why you're choosing one way or another. And you can make those comments in a very direct and um, clear way. I am uh, voting in favor for X, Y, and Z, or I am opposed because of A, B, and C, and then move on so that you've made your, your, um, you know, your point, made it clearly, and then have allowed for um, response from other people, so. Anything else? It's up to you all as a group to decide what you do with this. Alicia, I wanna make sure we check in with you. Yes, thank you, Athena. Um, I mean, I can add, I, I pretty much agreed with what everyone says. The only one thing that I would hope that we would also keep in mind is that I think it's difficult and there's this sort of like balancing act that really is, it's in all of our hands, but really it's in Lynn's hands because she's managing the meetings. But um, in terms of having a really good debate that is useful and just going over the same thing over and over again. And I think there's like a very fine line because I think that the debates that we have um, that are healthy and well are really important. Um, and I hope that we don't cut down our important debates, but that we can find a way to, you know, figure out if what we have said is really important and hasn't been said already and should be said again. Um, and, you know, I would just, again, encourage us to not step away from having really good debates. Thank you. So if there's nothing else that we wanna talk about in terms of meeting management, then I think we can move on to our, our conversation about criteria. So I'm gonna pass this over to Pamela to lead this discussion about criteria. <clears throat> and I'm going to keep a list going to kind of guide our, our conversation about what we all agree, what you all agree is the criteria you want to use when you make a decision to use your time and resources to make a referral or, and so on. So the PowerPoint slide is up. Well, I'm going to speed through them so that I can. <laughs> Right, so um, I'm just going to remind you guys that we are once again thinking about appreciative inquiry as a process. And we had envisioned having um, more time to go through the appreciative inquiry um, sort of journey. But in the wake of seeing the hour, I want to make sure that we uh, really allow time for us to have robust discussion about um, the, what the priorities are. So if I can advance the slide, keep going, keep going right there. So we're going we're gonna to start with um, this proposition that you fall into a deep sleep and then you wake up and um, Amherst is everything that you want it to be. You have thought about, um, in the prior slide that we skipped, you've thought about what's changing, what's emerging in, in town. Like, what are the new demographics going to look like? What are the fiscal responsibilities going to be? Have I thought about sustainability? So all of those things that really have an impact on your um, decision-making process. And then here you are, you wake up and Amherst has changed overnight. It is everything that you imagine it to be. And so the goal for this next session is to really think about what are the priorities that would achieve that dreamed reality. And um, we're going to ask you to do that by um, really taking a moment to answer this uh, question. You have some paper and pen in front of you. 
So what's new and different? How have you met the changing, emerging demands of the community? So if you'll take just about maybe five minutes to seriously think about this um, in light of what you think the future demands are going to be, thinking about fiscal responsibility, thinking about sustainability, thinking about the changing demographics. Um, and just take a moment and then we'll we'll go back and come back to as a large group and discuss that.
Are you ready to begin? All right, so I am really lazy and uh, don't want to run around like Vanna. We're actually going to do two rounds, and so I'm going to start here and walk around, and then for the second round, I'll start with Pat and walk around the other way. So we should just start by answering the question raised. Um, so um, we've incorporated um, social and economic justice for all um, in our community, and we are um, meeting the reasonable expectations of residents for what a municipality is expected to provide. And we achieve this with resources um, our residents uh, give to us as taxpayers, and they agree that their money was well spent. So that sounds right. That sounds really wonderful, but no specifics. Can you give me one specific example? One thing, just. Um, we're providing quality education for all of our young residents of our community. Okay, so um, I would always do a town that uses more of a, a global lens when it comes to fiscal responsibility. So, sorry, more of a uh, global lens when it comes to fiscal responsibility, sustainability, social justice issues, issues around race, um, more diverse representation um, throughout all town bodies um, with BIPOC community mainly, many that we haven't seen or heard from before. Um, that we would have less appropriation of such and just a more inclusive community where our, the, our residents are satisfied, are proud to be here and have way less complaints than they do so now. One specific example, we would have we would have figured out a process of how to fairly eliminate whether it be projects or whatever decision made when we face our very hard decisions that would have a result and more so a process that community could be satisfied with and live with the results. I would wake to a vision of a change in demographics from um, a, a town that would, where homes are converting to ownership as opposed to um, student rentals that there would be money available to help people buy the homes and fix them up and become long-term residents, and that there would be the homes available to actually buy. Um, I would see a place where schools are active and thriving, and I would see a town that generates enough energy to cover its own uh, electrical demands, as well as handle its own waste so that we uh, have less impact in the outer world. Um, my my specific would be that um, that the number of permanent residents actually grows um, above the student population of the town. Woman on a mission. All right. So um, when I wake up in this is November twenty twenty three, we're right. We're I had started my list like 20 years in the future. And then I was like, oh, wait, this is just a couple months away. All right. So uh, I will have woken up to a community which has passed a vote for a uh, debt exclusion. I will have woken up to a community that has clearly visible systems and a roadmap for reaching the climate goals that we have established. 
I will wake up in a community that is revolutionizing community safety, which we're already doing. I wake up the to that every day, but I'm excited to continue to wake up to that. Um, and that that challenges that and grows in it as well. I'll wake up in a community that has a plan and a clear outline for the other three capital projects, including a timeline and funding plan. I'll wake up in a community that has assistance programs for home buyers, first time home buyers, and, uh, and opportunities for um, mid range accessible homes. Um, and I'll wake up in a community that has a clear process for explaining how we do things and where opportunities for engagement are and that seeks those um, seeks to make those opportunities for engagement reflect our community and the community that we hope to be. So my very clear thing is that I would want to have a visible roadmap that shows exactly where we are on each goal that we have set out for um, for climate goals, but I think that, that that once we develop that system and, be, and it's beautiful, we can apply it to our other goals as well. But I'd like a literal thermometer. All right. Um, okay, so I would, uh, I'm waking up to a community where everyone has access to basic amenities to live, learn, and pursue work that's meaningful to them and enjoy in our government. Just added that after hearing you and then uh, waking up to a community that, um, that, that we are a caring community that sees our interconnectedness with each other and an, and our environment um, and that we and so we base once we are able to see that we are not separate we're really interdependent and interconnected that we work together then to solve our problems uh, we value all our service providers. Um, and when I said basic amenities, I meant housing, food, uh, education, jobs. Okay, and then um, equity, inclusion, and equal opportunities. And uh, we have creative ways to, where we don't get bogged down, but we're really like uh, trusting and working together to find solutions because I really do feel we are brilliant in this community and we're poetic and we're creative and artists and visionaries and that we bring in the best in each of us to work together to find the solutions for sustainable sustainability and um, economically and environmentally. And so if I had to choose one thing, I would choose that we are a caring community that sees our interconnectedness with each other and our environment. So I could start with saying ditto to all the above, but if I woke up, I would like to find that we were still historic New England town. And I would be focusing on having built um, and established a larger residential unit, which would be very diverse in terms of background, family, age, income, and owner and rental. Okay, And that there would be something that is not being planned in most things now, but lots of private and shared green space because the aim is community and that there be trees, that trees be everywhere. So that is my very specific dream. Thank you. Others have mentioned the four capital projects. So I'm gonna give my dittos and then I'm gonna add. So it's four capital projects. Um, the implementation of many of the CSWG recommendations. Uh, there is a, and that our schools are excellent and our staff and students are happy. Uh, so then I'm gonna go back and add, and we have a clearly articulated five-year plan to bring all of our roads up to good or excellent. Um, and we have a place, a plan to move forward on renovating or creating a new senior center. And that there is an appreciation of what the town council has achieved. <laughs> so Lynn is dreaming. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm gonna cross off a couple things because they've been mentioned, but I'm gonna start with the elementary school that it, it is built, it's open, 
It's leading the way in teaching the next generation about climate change. We're using it for the middle and the high school students to come and visit and think about what can happen in their own buildings. And it's a hub for the colleges and universities um, that they really see this as a shared community resource and it's a hub. And it's just the first of many, but we really build off the excitement and energy. Secondly, that we've found a better way of involving residents um, around village centers and interconnectedness. And they're involved in building the image, which was what we did with the master plan. So coming back to that, and at a very narrow level that I wake up and the North Amherst intersection has, <laughs> has finally been solved. And I've heard people say, oh my gosh, I come up to the survival center. Now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's, it's scary. Um, so then the next are looking outside us because um, I have always felt that a seven by seven square mile a uh, piece of land given to us to the, by the king way back when <laughs> is an odd way to think about what we want so that we're a hub in a region, that we're not thinking alone about housing and affordability, but we're thinking about it regionally. If something is three miles, four miles away, it's, we're part of the region. That the college in UMass think about us as a shared resource with financial re uh, responsibility and they're paying for it and we reform several elements of the state. So you asked one action I would do that would make this happen is succeed in our state legislature of starting to support municipal governments. And I can put a whole bunch, but I think we need to focus externally, not just internally. I'm gonna crash so that we don't forget Alicia. So I can I pass it to Alicia before I go, Alicia? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I kind of just wrote mine in a blurb and it wasn't written very nicely and cohesively. So bear with me for a second while I read my notes. Um, <clears throat> so um, I have inclusivity um, and power sharing. Um, oops, sorry, as one of the main focuses for what I would like to see or what I envision. Uh, for Amherst, making decisions with an equity and climate justice, justice lens, um, doing things within bounds, but in unique ways. So um, looking for more openness, honesty, and transparency in government. So more specifically, more explanations to the general public as to what's happening in the town government and how constituents can be involved. Um, so like maybe like online explanations as to like, this is what happened at this meeting, this is what you can look for, information to the public on how they can follow initiatives through councils and through different committee meetings um, that is accessible to the public and that is transparent and very easy to read and understand. Um, I would hope that town staff is well paid and feels supportive. Um, I would hope that downtown businesses were very inviting and had more events for families um, and things to do with younger kids besides just take them to the park. I would hope that there will be spaces that are more comfortable for BIPOC residents to be feel to feel comfortable, heard, valued, um, and spaces that feel like they were made for them. I would like to see, and this examples of these things would be stuff like the Youth Empowerment Center. Um, a multicultural center where I could explore and learn about other cultures, but where I could also celebrate my own heritage. Um, I would hope that there would be more support for families, and this would include things like housing and food stability, so access to home ownership, access to affordable um, housing, specifically uh, rent control that doesn't allow the cost of living to be exceedingly unreasonable in this town access to healthy foods so that we're not in a food desert where food is healthy and expensive or you have to drive out of town to be able to access food um, so that there would be more availability for food at uh, an affordable price for families inside of this town so that there um, I also hope that there is more representation in staff and caregivers so working to bridge the gap between the school systems and the families and the support for families in this community and the last thing I have on my list is better road conditions. Thank you. Um, so I started with the building projects. If, if we're looking six, well, six months as a dream, my, my rocks would 
says dream. So we can do anything in six months, right? So they would all be built, the library um, expansion, the school, um, the DPW and the fire station. So we have found the spot and built in six months. <laughs> um, they, they would all be built. Um, we would have more diverse participation and representation in government. Um, we would have found ways to increase our revenue to support everything we want to do that is not an increase on the backs of our own residents, which goes to exactly what Kathy was talking about, um, either from the state, from our other institutions, but something else that is not just increasing ta property taxes. Um, we would feel that our college students are full members of our community. Um, that they are participating in government, they are participating in our own community events, and they don't feel like we are a bifurcated community. Um, and we would have attainable housing. Um, we would have found a way to breach um, some of the divides we see, not only on our council, but within the community about what is the right way to approach housing and provide housing for all. And we would have done, done that and figured that out. I'm not going to repeat everything, um, but my very specific dream would be uh, as a mother of two teens who uh, are struggling to find connection um, in the community outside of, you know, being on their phones and the various apps that they use. Uh, I would wake up to a youth center and um, much more robust youth programming um, that would give them the opportunity to have more human connections with their peers. Thank you. <clears throat> so not surprisingly, um, I could just ditto what Dorothy said, since we're, um, we represent the same district in town, but um, you know, my vision or dream for Amherst um, would be that we have a vibrant downtown that retains its, you know, sense of place as a historic New England town on that scale um, that I, that we, remain a town. Um, I My fear for Amherst is that we would have the worst of a city and the worst of a small town. We'll never have the amenities of a city, but we could have traffic and tall buildings right up to the sidewalk. So I hope we can retain um, our sense of place. I would love to more and more. It's moving in that direction, but have downtown be a real gathering place, as Alicia was saying, for everyone in town, you know, to have our, our, our own village centers, but also a place where we would come downtown I've heard Anika talk about when she was a child that you'd go downtown and you would see everyone. And um, I'd love to see that come back. I think the Kendrick Clark playground was a good step in that direction. The Drake, um, I think as we have the um, North Common and um, you know, I'd love to see a, you know, an ice cream shop across the street from the Kendrick Clark playground. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and of course, you know, a youth center and a senior center and I think actually, Mandy Joe, this was a great. I, you said, I think in CRC that you know we're sort of becoming a two home town. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of university students and we have retirees, and I'd love to see more in between. So that that would be my dream um, for Amherst, and I I think you know to have more attainable and affordable housing for renters and first time homeowners. I I would like to less see the neighborhoods where you know are people have lived for years and years, you know, not just be seen as investment opportunities, which, you know, I know, uh, particularly in some of the neighborhoods closer to town and uh, the university that, that we feel like we're becoming that. And of course, you know, a new school is central to filling in the two humps and having families with children, you know, be able to move to Amherst and to want to move here. I've slept longer than some of you. So, Everything is built. We have an incredible DPW. The fire station is where uh, um, down on West Pomeroy Lane, and there's affordable housing there. Uh, the library has been built, and the new school is more than up and running. It's thriving. Uh, the Youth Empowerment Center has been built. Um, and there's also uh, Ancestral Bridges has a cultural museum that's been built. Uh, some of these things have been funded through uh, pilot increases in, in pilot payments. Amherst College has donated enough money to build one of the projects at least and is donating more money to build uh, um, 
uh, house, a tiny home uh, community uh, in Amherst. The town staff is well paid, including our teachers, um, and their time is really respected by the town council. Um, what's new and different is that we are not a food desert, that the mobile market is um, flyingly successful and has collaborated with local farmers. Uh, it has, uh, the co-op is up and running and there are shares in the co-op and in the mobile market that are for people with low to no income. Housing, it's not even an issue anymore. We have a great deal of infill that has enabled us to enrich the housing stock, uh, home ownership for home ownership and for renters. Um, there, everything that is built now in Amherst and all of these structures, whether it's a private home or um, a municipal building, is net zero. Uh, and we have. Um, solar panels on just about everything except our older forests, which we are protecting because of their impact in uh, fighting climate change. Uh, all the new housing is intentionally mixed income, uh, but also mixed ability that we're building so people with cognitive or physical disabilities, as well as differences in economic levels can be integrated in all our neighborhoods uh, and that we don't even notice um, that that's happening because we've gotten so used to it. There's a beautiful modern band shell on the North Common, the one that um, was finally selected and um, by uh, the bid in the chamber and many of us. The, uh, the Amherst is grown into a thriving, flexible, diverse community and members of the town council and all committees are diverse in multiple ways, but they function collaboratively. They have a vision of uh, looking at difference as a dynamic that can trigger creativity. Um, let me see. Uh, I, th I think that's probably, oh, the state distribution of money through the fair share amendment and for roads and sidewalks, and it, it has to be, uh, it's coming in because it's no longer per capita, but it's by miles. And uh, I've retired. But what I noticed um, from listening to your futuristic visions of the community is that you have more in common than you have uh, um, as differences. And that in each description, this community is alive and vibrant and thriving um, and is taking account of all of the community members. Here comes the hard part, and that's the next slide, right? How do you get there? How do you decide what your priorities are? What are the actionable strategies that you would need to do to implement, to bring your vision forward? And as you think about this question, I want you to also think about what's the criteria you're gonna use for setting your priorities as a current elective body now. So we're gonna give you, you know, three to five minutes to think about these questions. What are your strategies? What's the criteria you're gonna use? And then we'll have another round. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll start with Jennifer in a minute. <laughs> okay.
We're going to begin. Okay, so how do we get there? I, I don't have huge specific, well, I have one very specific one, which is we need to approve the borrowing from the schools um, and and the library when it comes up again, the, the potential increase in borrowing authorization, even if it doesn't increase our own borrowing. Um, the other two aren't as specific. I think we need to look at zoning changes that show a willingness to try things, particularly as it relates to housing, um, but also village-centered development in general, business development, commercial development. It's not just all about housing. Um, and then reevaluate our budget and department priorities. Um, are there areas and departments or budget areas that aren't necessarily Come, you know, within or directing towards those priorities we just said, and is that a sp spot to reduce spending that we could then increase somewhere else? Um, so reevaluating that potentially from a ground up point instead of starting with what do we already have and keeping that level. Um, criteria to use. Um, does the action that is proposed to the council advance us towards the vision? that we had or that we just said? Um, is it within our authority to, to act? Um, are we being asked to do something we can do? How much of a difference will whatever is being asked of us make towards reaching that vision? And then one that isn't always thought of, will not acting advance us towards the vision, right? You know, What's the consequence of not acting on that proposal? You know, when a proposal's in front of us, we're given a choice, stay with what we have or change. Which one, even if we're not sure changing will get us a lot of say, much of a difference, a huge difference, will it make more of a difference than not doing anything? So thinking about what the not doing anything does. 
I just was questioning which counterclockwise or clockwise. So I'm two. Okay. So um, does Alicia want to come before me? Alicia, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, sure. Um, okay. Uh, so what I have, uh, sorry, I forget exactly what the question was, but like the three actionable things that could be done. I think for me, the, the number one thing would be inclusivity for town government um, and, and representation and leadership, because I think without the diversity and representation and in positions of leadership, then none of the other changes are even possible. Um, and so um, the actionable steps that I have for increasing inclusivity for town government and uh, leaders would be stipends, um, increasing stipends, looking at how we can shorten the meeting times, being more flexible with meeting times. So for example, not having committee meetings during the week when people would be at work, um, increasing public access and participation, um, because I think people don't generally want to run for councils or committees when they don't know what's really going on inside those committees. So increasing general access to participation, I think would increase like in turn, eventually increase the ability we have to have diverse representation in leadership. Um, and then like informa information sessions, like, like how we had before where Athena went through um, the rules and how motions were. I think having stuff like that available to the general public is really important. Like that would have been super helpful for me to have before um, I ran for council. And I think that that might be like having access to information like that might be you know, might change someone's mind as to whether or not they feel like they're prepared to take on a job like this. Um, the other action I have would be a community outreach. Um, and I think that I, I thought about this, this in terms of applying that to all of the other actions. And so like canvassing, getting input, getting information on different levels of in, impact, um, because I think for me, Anyhow, I, I often bring up my certain perspective, which is, you know, I'm a renter, I'm a single parent, and so I have a different perspective. And I think a lot of the time I hear feedback in terms of my perspective not being heard more often or not being well represented, like there aren't many other people who have said that. And I think that just speaks to our level of outreach and canvassing. And so I think we need more information on the different, the levels of impact that certain initiatives have on our community. So like whether or not this is a, a positive impact for some people, I think we need that information. Whether or not this is not positive or has no effect at all, I think we need more information on understanding the scope of what our decisions are. Um, and, and then after doing that outreach, I think that's the first step. The second step is then actually taking that into consideration and figuring out how to implement that. Because you know we can say things like, we hear you, we understand the school building is really expensive, but then not doing anything to help the families or to figure out what we can do to offset the tax increase is not actually taking those things into consideration. So I think that's like a two-part step for me, which would be taking the listening to community outreach, but then figuring out how to make that into an implementable decision that will impact the feedback that we heard. Um, and then the... Next actionable step I have is allocation of resources or redistributing redistributing the wealth or the budget. So figuring out a balance. So like which, which initiatives do we want to continue to fund? What things do we wanna move away from? What things do we want to pour into that we haven't done yet? Um, and I think that again, figuring out priorities in order to do this um, would have to fall back on outreach because I think we all individually have our own priorities and that understanding how those priorities affect the community and how our decisions affect the community at large um, should really play into how we distribute our wealth, which to me is how you set your priorities in a position like this, um, because things only happen when we either apply money or time to them. And so I guess also applying time, like setting aside extra meetings, like how we did, I think would be another way that we can figure out how to prioritize um, what we're looking to accomplish. Um, okay, I, I have two buckets. 
that I've put these in. The first is looking internally to what we might be able to do at the Amherst level. Uh, the, and I don't know which one I list first here. Um, I think on any zoning change that's significant, we need to figure out a way to build consensus with a lot of public input. And I would go with the think about consequences, think about alternatives before we go out to try to craft the specific change. Because um, if we can build consensus around some changes, like we did with inclusionary zoning, it moves really fast, or ADUs. So that would be number one, to try to think of a process that's more inclusive. Secondly, to go with that, um, some towns make design review mandatory rather than just advisory. And that has worked quite well because it builds in this notion of building consensus. People are not opposed to change. They just would like to know what it looks like. Within that one, many towns, not that many in Amherst, but most of the towns in Vermont have something called an impact fee, that large developments actually come with a public cost. And you have them participate, road repair, parks. Uh, Burlington has a series of them. They help in easing the pain. So though, and then my third internal is budget. Um, what Alicia just talked about is our larger budget. We have to make choices and we might have a 10 year horizon, but it's like, if we've got 90 million and that's including, or with the uh, other, with our other funds, a hundred million, that's it. That's all we've got to work with. So if we say, what's our 10 year plan? What are there new initiatives? What are we gonna drop? getting better at looking that, not just the budget. My two external are uh, be more strategic on approaching, I'll say, Amherst College. Build a coalition, working with the council, not just sending our town manager, a coalition to go to the trustees, alums, former faculty members, illustrative members who don't live in Amherst, and go in with strength in numbers and say, we're talking about climate and education, that nobody lives in a bubble and appeal to their mission. We need those extra dollars. And the one other external is unite with other towns um, and the MMA on better pilot payments, town land uh, and nonprofits. Really move the needle on that rather than just talk about it. Um, in the interest of time and not being redundant, um, in order to achieve the goals I would like to see us achieve, I think we need to work federally at the state level, at the local level, and with our higher education institutions. Let me just give you one or two quick examples. Federally is where I think we really need to be looking for reparations money. For the state level, definitely the pilot program and any number of other programs that would better support local government making tough decisions at the local level and getting our higher ed institutions to realize the impact they have on our town and help cover the expense of that. Um, I'm going to be echoing um, Kathy. Um, part of what I mean by being a New England town is that there's a heck of a lot of self-determination, that things are not imposed upon us that citizens feel that they have agency, that they participate in the decisions that affect their lives. So some of the zoning thing was started off by previous Governor Baker, and I know it's things like this have been coming down in other areas about infill, infill density, but, and I understand the goals, but it's important that things not be imposed from outside, but that people are involved in the decisions and that we maintain agency. Thank you. Um, so similar, some similar thoughts here. I'd like to see improved state and federal advocacy. I think that we've, um, we have a real opportunity with this form of government to improve our advocacy, especially on the state level. Uh, and I'd like to see us realize that with, you know, showing, um, showing up pre-budget season to our legislators with priorities, showing up to uh, give feedback and actually having discussions on the, the state budget, which we do this to some degree, but I think that there's a significant room for improvement in terms of how we advocate and how strongly we advocate. 
Um, I'd like to see systems for updating uh, our community and the council on movement towards our goals, so specifically our racial equity and climate action goals. Uh, and that might include some movement towards things like uh, um, opting into different stretch codes that come out, as well as um, looking at net zero requirements for, for example, this is an example. There's no bad ideas in a brainstorm. I have not written. This is not a thing I've written. Um, but you know, are we looking at, for example, a net zero code for any new multifamily or apartment buildings, right? So there, there are opportunities both legislatively and within process. Um, I skipped a little bit of one uh, before that I want to revisit in my in my wake up my who was it Rip Van Winkle. Thing. Yeah, um, I wake up and the state legislature has passed our transfer fee because I do think that that for me is one of the big actionable things that I'd like to see. Um, revisiting and revamping the roles of our CPOs, our community participation officers, uh, to reach the, the um, goals that we talked about in terms of community engagement. And then also measuring our public input and recognizing the voices that we aren't hearing. Uh, and communicating impact and establishing process, which kind of feeds into that CPO role a little bit as well, but a lot falls on us to do that. But recognizing the um, the voices that we're hearing and and uh, who they represent, and that's those those are important voices and important people, and we want to recognize that and also seek out the voices that aren't coming to the table. Um, just clarification, are we also talking about the priority priority criteria right now? We are? Okay. Um, okay, so my main one thing was to build a caring community with, um, with a, you know, understanding our interconnectedness. So with that in mind, I had a specific suggestion where every level of school and municipality, it's part of a training. I don't think it comes naturally. It comes naturally to care for people who think like us, but it doesn't come naturally to care for people who think differently. So I actually do think it's a good idea to include in our schools and every level of municipality, these ideas, training and appreciative inquiry, compassion and critical thinking. So, you know, challenging assumptions and not just believing and, you know, seeing things for ourselves. So that's at a foundational level. And then more specifically, um, housing is one thing being part of CRC. We've been hearing so much that people are not able to live in our town and we don't have the diversity. We're losing some of the diversity, which, um, which you know, whatever. So, so for that, I think my specific suggestion was... Um, that we do a study, not like a study study, not a consultant study, but just internally, like what are the challenges that different community members are in experiencing? Like what do they need and want in order to live in our community? And I say that just because I've spoken to several teachers and I'm like, what if we were able to make your housing affordable? Would you then move back? And they're like, no, the, the space we have in Leverett, for instance, and the land and everything. So even if you made it cheaper for me to come to Amherst, I wouldn't because I appreciate. So, I mean, what I'm, that's just to say that we are hypothesizing, we're guessing that that's what people need and want within 13 of us. But to have, again, the community engagement process where we are really having a systematic way of reaching beyond our own neighborhoods, how do we uh, to create that process? to engage with different stakeholders and really listen and then have a process to um, make decisions from that. Um, the other thing I was thinking of was, yeah, and one other tangible thing is to have an econo economic development director who can actively work with the, with the council, with our committees, and then also proactively work with our local builders or even non-local builders who build tiny homes or those, they have that expertise to build the kind of housing that we want to see rather than waiting for someone to show up and be reactive, we, we can be proactive. And then in terms of priorities, like how do we prioritize? I really think that's so important that we have a shared intention and goal when we're working in as a council. So I had the priority set up around three main headings that uh, one is we should prioritize based on our goals as a council and manager goals. And, and so each proposal can be rated based on 
So when we have a proposal that's made, like we think about how is this contributing to our goals related to safety? That's a very important, you know, um, goal in our town. Environment, uh, equity, and inclusion.